The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part One, Chapter Thirteen "'Well, Captain, where are we going to begin?' asked Pencroft, next morning of the engineer. "'At the beginning,' replied Cyrus Harding. And, in fact, the settlers were compelled to begin at the very beginning. They did not possess even the tools necessary for making tools, and they were not even in the condition of nature, who, having time, husbands her strength. They had no time, since they had to provide for the immediate wants of their existence, and though, profiting by acquired experience, they had nothing to invent, still they had everything to make. Their iron and their steel were as yet only in the state of minerals, their earthenware in the state of clay, their linen and their clothes in the state of textile material. It must be said, however, that the settlers were men in the complete and higher sense of the word. The engineer Harding could not have been seconded by more intelligent companions nor with more devotion and zeal. He had tried them, he knew their abilities. Gideon Spilett, a talented reporter, having learned everything so as to be able to speak of everything, would contribute largely with his head and hands to the colonization of the island. He would not draw back from any task. A determined sportsman, he would make a business of what till then had only been a pleasure to him. Herbert, a gallant boy, already remarkably well informed in the natural sciences, would render greater service to the common cause. Neb was devotion personified, clever, intelligent, indefatigable, robust, with iron health. He knew a little about the work of the forge, and could not fail to be very useful in the colony. As to Pencroft, he had sailed over every sea, a carpenter in the dockyards in Brooklyn, assistant tailor in the vessels of the state, gardener, cultivator during his holidays, etc., and, like all seamen, fit for anything, he knew how to do everything. It would have been difficult to unite five men better fitted to struggle against fate, more certain to triumph over it. At the beginning, Cyrus Harding had said, now this beginning of which the engineer spoke was the construction of an apparatus which would serve to transform the natural substances. The part which heat plays in these transformations is known. Now fuel, wood or coal, was ready for immediate use, and an oven must be built to use it. "'What is this oven for?' asked Pencroft. "'To make the pottery which we have need of,' replied Harding. "'And of what shall we make the oven?' with bricks. And the bricks? With clay. Let us start, my friends. To save trouble we will establish our manufactory at the place of production. Neb will bring provisions, and there will be no lack of fire to cook the food. No, replied the reporter, but if there is a lack of food for want of instruments for the chase. Ah, if only we had a knife, cried the sailor. Well, asked Cyrus Harding, well, I would soon make a bow and arrows, and then there would be plenty of game in the larder. Yes, a knife, a sharp blade, said the engineer, as if he was speaking to himself. At this moment his eyes fell upon Top, who was running about on the shore. Suddenly Harding's face became animated. Top, here, said he. The dog came at his master's call. The latter took Top's head between his hands and unfastening the collar which the animal wore round his neck, he broke it in two, saying, "'There are two knives, Pencroft.' Two hurrahs from the sailor was the reply. Top's collar was made of a thin piece of tempered steel. They had only to sharpen it on a piece of sandstone, then to raise the edge on a finer stone. Now sandstone was abundant on the beach, and two hours after the stock of tools in the colony consisted of two sharp blades, which were easily fixed in solid handles. The production of these their first tools was hailed as a triumph. It was indeed a valuable result of their labor, and a very opportune one. They set out. Cyrus Harding proposed that they should return to the western shore of the lake, where the day before he had noticed the clayey ground of which he possessed a specimen. They therefore followed the bank of the Mercy, traversed Prospect Heights, 
and after a walk of five miles or more they reached a glade situated two hundred feet from Lake Grant. On the way Herbert had discovered a tree, the branches of which the Indians of South America employ for making their bows. It was the Krijimba, of the palm family, which does not bear edible fruit. Long straight branches were cut, the leaves stripped off, it was shaped, stronger in the middle, more slender at the extremities, and nothing remained to be done but to find a plant fit to make the bowstring. This was the Hibiscus heterophilus, which furnishes fibres of such remarkable tenacity that they have been compared to the tendons of animals. Pencroft thus obtained bows of tolerable strength, for which he only wanted arrows. These were easily made with straight, stiff branches, without knots, but the points with which they must be armed, that is to say, a substance to serve in lieu of iron, could not be met with so easily. But Pencroft said that having done his part of the work, chance would do the rest. The settlers arrived on the ground which had been discovered the day before. Being composed of the sort of clay which is used for making bricks and tiles, it was very useful for the work in question. There was no great difficulty in it. It was enough to scour the clay with sand, then to mould the bricks and bake them by the heat of a wood fire. Generally bricks are formed in moulds, but the engineer contented himself with making them by hand. All that day, and the day following, were employed in this work. The clay, soaked in water, was mixed by the feet and hands of the manipulators, and then divided into pieces of equal size. A practiced workman can make, without a machine, about ten thousand bricks in twelve hours. But in their two days' work the five brickmakers on Lincoln Island had not made more than three thousand, which were ranged near each other until the time when their complete desiccation would permit them to be used in building the oven that is to say, in three or four days. It was on the 2nd of April that Harding had employed himself in fixing the orientation of the island, or, in other words, the precise spot where the sun rose. The day before he had noted exactly the hour when the sun disappeared beneath the horizon, making allowance for the refraction. This morning he noted, no less exactly, the hour at which it reappeared. Between this setting and rising, twelve hours, twenty-four minutes passed. Then, six hours, twelve minutes after its rising, the sun on this day would exactly pass the meridian, and the point of the sky which it occupied at this moment would be the north. At the set hour, Cyrus marked this point, and putting in a line with the sun two trees which would serve him for marks, he thus obtained an invariable meridian for his ulterior operations. The settlers employed the two days before the oven was built, in collecting fuel. Branches were cut all round the glade, and they picked up all the fallen wood under the trees. They were also able to hunt with greater success, since Pencroft now possessed some dozen arrows armed with sharp points. It was Top who had furnished these points by bringing in a porcupine, rather inferior eating, but of great value, thanks to the quills with which it bristled. These quills were fixed firmly at the ends of the arrows, the flight of which was made more certain by some cockatoo's feathers. The reporter and Herbert soon became very skilful archers. Game of all sorts, in consequence, abounded at the chimneys, capybaras, pigeons, agutis, grouse, etc. The greater part of these animals were killed in the part of the forest on the left bank of the Mercy, to which they gave the name of Jacamar Wood, in remembrance of the bird which Pencroft and Herbert had pursued when on their first exploration. This game was eaten fresh, but they preserved some capybara hams by smoking them above a fire of green wood, after having perfumed them with sweet-smelling leaves. However, this food, although very strengthening, was always roast upon roast, and the party would have been delighted to hear some soup bubbling on the hearth, but they must wait till a pot could be made, and consequently till the oven was built. During these excursions, which were not extended far from the brickfield, the hunters could discern the recent passage of animals of a large size, armed with powerful claws 
but they could not recognize the species. Cyrus Harding advised them to be very careful, as the forest probably enclosed many dangerous beasts. And he did right. Indeed, Gideon Spilett and Herbert one day saw an animal which resembled a jaguar. Happily the creature did not attack them, or they might not have escaped without a severe wound. As soon as he could get a regular weapon, that is to say, one of the guns which Pencroft begged for, Gideon Spilett resolved to make desperate war against the ferocious beasts, and exterminate them from the island. The chimneys during these few days were not made more comfortable, for the engineer hoped to discover, or build if necessary, a more convenient dwelling. They contented themselves with spreading moss and dry leaves on the sand of the passages, and on these primitive couches the tired workers slept soundly. They also reckoned the days they had passed on Lincoln Island, and from that time kept a regular account. The 5th of April, which was Wednesday, was twelve days from the time when the wind threw the castaways on this shore. On the 6th of April, at daybreak, the engineer and his companions were collected in the glade, at the place where they were going to perform the operation of baking the bricks. Naturally this had to be in the open air, and not in a kiln, or rather the agglomeration of bricks made an enormous kiln which would bake itself. The fuel, made of well-prepared faggots, was laid on the ground and surrounded with several rows of dried bricks, which soon formed an enormous cube, to the exterior of which they contrived air-holes. The work lasted all day, and it was not till the evening that they set fire to the faggots. No one slept that night, all watching carefully to keep up the fire. The operation lasted forty-eight hours, and succeeded perfectly. It then became necessary to leave the smoking mass to cool, and during this time Neb and Pencroft, guided by Cyrus Harding, brought, on a hurdle made of interlaced branches, loads of carbonate of lime and common stones, which were very abundant, to the north of the lake. These stones, when decomposed by heat, made a very strong quicklime, greatly increased by slacking, at least as pure as if it had been produced by the calcination of chalk or marble. Mixed with sand, the lime made excellent mortar. The result of these different works was that, on the ninth of April, the engineer had at his disposal a quantity of prepared lime and some thousands of bricks. Without losing an instant, therefore, they began the construction of a kiln to bake the pottery, which was indispensable for their domestic use. They succeeded without much difficulty. Five days after, the kiln was supplied with coal, which the engineer had discovered lying open to the sky towards the mouth of the Red Creek, and the first smoke escaped from a chimney twenty feet high. The glade was transformed into a manufactory and Pencroft was not far wrong in believing that from this kiln would issue all the products of modern industry. In the meantime, what the settlers first manufactured was a common pottery in which to cook their food. The chief material was clay, to which Harding added a little lime and quartz. This paste made regular pipe clay, with which they manufactured bowls, cups molded on stones of a proper size, great jars, and pots to hold water, etc. The shape of these objects was clumsy and defective, but after they had been baked at a high temperature, the kitchen of the chimneys was provided with a number of utensils, as precious to the settlers as the most beautifully enameled china. We must mention here that Pencroft, desirous to know if the clay thus prepared was worthy of its name of pipe clay, made some large pipes, which he thought charming, but for which, alas, he had no tobacco, and that was a great privation to Pencroft. "'But tobacco will come like everything else,' he repeated, in a burst of absolute confidence. This work lasted till the 15th of April, and the time was well employed. The settlers, having become potters, made nothing but pottery. When it suited Cyrus Harding to change them into smiths, they would become smiths. But the next day being Sunday, and also Easter Sunday, all agreed to sanctify the day by rest. 
these Americans were religious men, scrupulous observers of the precepts of the Bible, and their situation could not but develop sentiments of confidence towards the author of all things. On the evening of the 15th of April they returned to the chimneys, carrying with them the pottery, the furnace being extinguished until they could put it to a new use. Their return was marked by a fortunate incident. The engineer discovered a substance which replaced tinder. It is known that a spongy, velvety flesh is procured from a certain mushroom of the genus Polyporus. Properly prepared, it is extremely inflammable, especially when it has previously been saturated with gunpowder or boiled in a solution of nitrate or chlorate of potash. But till then they had not found any of these polypores, or even any of the morels which could replace them. On this day the engineer, seeing a plant belonging to the wormwood genus, the principal species of which are absinthe, balm mint, tarragon, etc., gathered several tufts, and presenting them to the sailor said, Here, Pencroft, this will please you. Pencroft looked attentively at the plant, covered with long silky hair, the leaves being clothed with soft down. "'What's that, Captain?' asked Pencroft. "'Is it tobacco?' "'No,' replied Harding. "'It is wormwood. Chinese wormwood to the learned, but to us it will be tinder.' When the wormwood was properly dried, it provided them with a very inflammable substance, especially afterwards when the engineer had impregnated it with nitrate of potash of which the island possessed several beds, and which is, in truth, saltpetre. The colonists had a good supper that evening. Neb prepared some agouti soup, a smoked capybara ham, to which was added the boiled tubercules of the caladium mycorrhizum, an herbaceous plant of the arum family. They had an excellent taste, and were very nutritious being something similar to the substance which is sold in England under the name of Portland Sago. They were also a good substitute for bread, which the settlers in Lincoln Island did not yet possess. When supper was finished, before sleeping, Harding and his companions went to take the air on the beach. It was eight o'clock in the evening. The night was magnificent. The moon, which had been full five days before, had not yet risen but the horizon was already silvered by those soft, pale shades which might be called the dawn of the moon. At the southern zenith glittered the circumpolar constellations, and above all the southern cross, which some days before the engineer had greeted on the summit of Mount Franklin. Cyrus Harding gazed for some time at this splendid constellation, which has at its summit and at its base two stars of the first magnitude, at its left arm a star of the second, and at its right arm a star of the third magnitude. Then, after some minutes' thought, Herbert, he asked of the lad, is not this the 15th of April? Yes, Captain, replied Herbert. Well, if I am not mistaken, to-morrow will be one of the four days in the year in which the real time is identical with average time. That is to say, my boy, that to-morrow, to within some seconds, the sun will pass the meridian just at midday by the clocks. If the weather is fine, I think that I shall obtain the longitude of the island with an approximation of some degrees. "'Without instruments? Without a sextant?' asked Gideon Spilett. "'Yes,' replied the engineer. "'Also, since the night is clear, I will try this very evening to obtain our latitude by calculating the height of the southern cross, that is, from the southern pole above the horizon. You understand, my friends, that before undertaking the work of installation in earnest it is not enough to have found out that this land is an island. We must, as nearly as possible, know at what distance it is situated, either from the American continent or Australia, or from the principal archipelagos of the Pacific. In fact, said the reporter, instead of building a house, it would be more important to build a boat, if by chance we are not more than a hundred miles from an inhabited coast. That is why, returned Harding, 
I am going to try this evening to calculate the latitude of Lincoln Island, and tomorrow at midday I will try to calculate the longitude. If the engineer had possessed a sextant, an apparatus with which the angular distance of objects can be measured with great precision, there would have been no difficulty in the operation. This evening by the height of the pole, the next day by the passing of the sun at the meridian, he would obtain the position of the island, but as they had not won, he would have to supply the deficiency. Harding then entered the chimneys. By the light of the fire he cut two little flat rulers, which he joined together at one end, so as to form a pair of compasses, whose legs could separate or come together. The fastening was fixed with a strong acacia thorn which was found in the woodpile. This instrument finished, the engineer returned to the beach, but as it was necessary to take the height of the pole from above a clear horizon, that is, a sea horizon, and his claw cape hid the southern horizon, he was obliged to look for a more suitable station. The best would evidently have been the shore exposed directly to the south, but the mercy would have to be crossed, and that was a difficulty. Harding resolved, in consequence, to make his observation from Prospect Heights, taking into consideration its height above the level of the sea, a height which he intended to calculate next day by a simple process of elementary geometry. The settlers, therefore, went to the plateau, ascending the left bank of the Mercy, and placed themselves on the edge which looked northwest and southeast, that is, above the curiously shaped rocks which bordered the river. This part of the plateau commanded the heights of the left bank, which sloped away to the extremity of Claw Cape and to the southern side of the island. No obstacle intercepted their gaze, which swept the horizon in a semicircle from the cape to reptile end. To the south the horizon, lighted by the first rays of the moon, was very clearly defined against the sky. At this moment the southern cross presented itself to the observer in an inverted position, the star Alpha marking its base, which is nearer to the southern pole. This constellation is not situated as near to the Antarctic pole as the polar star is to the Arctic pole. The star Alpha is about twenty-seven degrees from it, but Cyrus Harding knew this and made allowance for it in his calculation. He then took care also to observe the moment when it passed the meridian below the pole, which would simplify the operation. Cyrus Harding pointed one leg of the compasses to the horizon, the other to Alpha, and the space between the two legs gave him the angular distance which separated Alpha from the horizon. In order to fix the angle obtained, he fastened with thorns the two pieces of wood on a third placed transversely, so that their separation should be properly maintained. That done, there was only the angle to calculate by bringing back the observation to the level of the sea, taking into consideration the depression of the horizon, which would necessitate measuring the height of the cliff. The value of this angle would give the height of Alpha, and consequently that of the pole above the horizon, that is to say, the latitude of the island, since the latitude of a point of the globe is always equal to the height of the pole above the horizon of this point. The calculations were left for the next day, and at ten o'clock every one was sleeping soundly. End of chapter The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part 1, Chapter 14 The next day, the 16th of April, and Easter Sunday, the settlers issued from the chimneys at daybreak, and proceeded to wash their linen. The engineer intended to manufacture soap as soon as he could procure the necessary materials, soda or potash, fat or oil the important question of renewing their wardrobe would be treated of in the proper time and place. At any rate, their clothes would last at least six months longer, for they were strong, and could resist the wear of manual labor. But all would depend on the situation of the island with regard to inhabited land. 
This would be settled today, if the weather permitted. The sun rising above a clear horizon announced a magnificent day, one of those beautiful autumn days which are like the last farewells of the warm season. It was now necessary to complete the observations of the evening before, by measuring the height of the cliff above the level of the sea. "'Shall you not need an instrument similar to the one which you used yesterday?' said Herbert to the engineer. "'No, my boy,' replied the latter. "'We are going to proceed differently, but in as precise a way.' Herbert, wishing to learn everything he could, followed the engineer to the beach. Pencroft, Neb, and the reporter remained behind and occupied themselves in different ways. Cyrus Harding had provided himself with a straight stick, twelve feet long, which he had measured as exactly as possible by comparing it with his own height, which he knew to a hair. Herbert carried a plumb line which Harding had given him, that is to say, a simple stone fastened to the end of a flexible fibre. Having reached a spot about twenty feet from the edge of the beach, and nearly five hundred feet from the cliff, which rose perpendicularly, Harding thrust the pole two feet into the sand, and wedging it up carefully, he managed, by means of the plumb line, to erect it perpendicularly with the plane of the horizon. That done, he retired the necessary distance, when, lying on the sand, his eye glanced at the same time at the top of the pole and the crest of the cliff. He carefully marked the place with a little stick. Then, addressing Herbert, "'Do you know the first principles of geometry?' he asked. "'Slightly, Captain,' replied Herbert, who did not wish to put himself forward. "'You remember what are the properties of two similar triangles?' "'Yes,' replied Herbert. "'Their homologous sides are proportional.' Well, my boy, I have just constructed two similar right-angled triangles. The first, the smallest, has for its sides the perpendicular pole, the distance which separates the little stick from the foot of the pole, and my visual ray for hypotenuse. The second has for its sides the perpendicular cliff, the height of which we wish to measure, the distance which separates the little stick from the bottom of the cliff, and my visual ray also forms its hypotenuse, which proves to be prolongation of that of the first triangle. "'Ah, Captain, I understand,' cried Herbert. "'As the distance from the stick to the pole is to this distance from the stick to the base of the cliff, so was the height of the pole to the height of the cliff.' "'Just so, Herbert,' replied the engineer. "'And when we have measured the first two distances, knowing the height of the pole, we shall only have a sum in proportion to do, which will give us the height of the cliff, and will save us the trouble of measuring it directly. The two horizontal distances were found out by means of the pole, whose length above the sand was exactly ten feet. The first distance was fifteen feet between the stick and the place where the pole was thrust into the sand. The second distance between the stick and the bottom of the cliff was five hundred feet. These measurements finished, Cyrus Harding and the lad returned to the chimneys. The engineer then took a flat stone which he had brought back from one of his previous excursions, a sort of slate, on which it was easy to trace figures with a sharp shell. He then proved the following proportions. Fifteen is to five hundred, as ten is to x. 500 times 10 equals 5,000. 5,000 divided by 15 equals 333.3. 3, 3. From which it was proved that the granite cliff measured 333 feet in height. Cyrus Harding then took the instrument which he had made the evening before, the space between its two legs giving the angular distance between the star Alpha and the horizon. He measured very exactly the opening of this angle on a circumference which he divided into 360 equal parts. Now this angle, by adding to it the 27 degrees which separated Alpha from the Antarctic Pole, and by reducing to the level of the sea the height of the cliff on which the observation had been made, was found to be 53 degrees. These 53 degrees being subtracted from 90 degrees, 
the distance from the pole to the equator, there remained 37 degrees. Cyrus Harding concluded, therefore, that Lincoln Island was situated on the 37th degree of the southern latitude, or taking into consideration through the imperfection of the performance an error of five degrees, that it must be situated between the 35th and the 40th parallel. There was only the longitude to be obtained, and the position of the island would be determined. The engineer hoped to attempt this the same day at twelve o'clock, at which moment the sun would pass the meridian. It was decided that Sunday should be spent in a walk, or rather an exploring expedition, to that side of the island between the north of the lake and Shark Gulf, and if there was time they would push their discoveries to the northern side of Cape South Mandible. They would breakfast on the downs and not return till evening. At half-past eight the little band was following the edge of the channel. On the other side, on Safety Islet, numerous birds were gravely strutting. They were divers, easily recognized by their cry, which much resembles the braying of a donkey. Pencroft only considered them in an eatable point of view, and learnt with some satisfaction that their flesh, though blackish, is not bad food. Great amphibious creatures could also be seen crawling on the sand, seals, doubtless, who appeared to have chosen the islet for a place of refuge. It was impossible to think of those animals in an elementary point of view, for their oily flesh is detestable. However, Cyrus Harding observed them attentively, and without making known his idea, he announced to his companions that very soon they would pay a visit to the islet. The beach was strewn with innumerable shells, some of which would have rejoiced the heart of a conchologist. There were, among others, the Phasianella, the Terebratula, etc. But what would be of more use was the discovery, by Neb, at low tide, of a large oyster-bed among the rocks, nearly five miles from the chimneys. "'Neb will not have lost his day!' cried Pencroft, looking at the spacious oyster-bed. It is really a fortunate discovery, said the reporter, and as it is said that each oyster produces yearly from fifty to sixty thousand eggs, we shall have an inexhaustible supply there. Only I believe that the oyster is not very nourishing, said Herbert. No, replied Harding, the oyster contains very little nitrogen, and if a man lived exclusively on them he would have to eat not less than fifteen to sixteen dozen a day. Capital, replied Pencroft. We might swallow dozens and dozens without exhausting the bed. Shall we take some for breakfast? And without waiting for a reply to this proposal, knowing that it would be approved of, the sailor and Neb detached a quantity of the mollusks. They put them in a sort of net of hibiscus fibre, which Neb had manufactured, and which already contained food. They then continued to climb the coast between the downs and the sea. From time to time Harding consulted his watch, so as to be prepared in time for the solar observation, which had to be made exactly at midday. All that part of the island was very barren as far as the point which closed Union Bay, and which had received the name of Cape South Mandible. Nothing could be seen there but sand and shells, mingled with debris of lava. A few seabirds frequented this desolate coast, gulls, great albatrosses, as well as wild duck, for which Pencroft had a great fancy. He tried to knock some over with an arrow, but without result, for they seldom perched, and he could not hit them on the wing. This led the sailor to repeat to the engineer, "'You see, Captain, so long as we have not one or two fowling pieces, we shall never get anything.' "'Doubtless, Pencroft,' replied the reporter, "'but it depends on you.' Procure us some iron for the barrels, steel for the hammers, saltpetre, coal, and sulphur for powder, mercury and nitric acid for the fulminate, and lead for the shot, and the captain will make us first-rate guns. Oh, replied the engineer, we might no doubt find all these substances on the island, but a gun is a delicate instrument, and needs very particular tools. However, we shall see later." 
Why, cried Pencroft, were we obliged to throw overboard all the weapons we had with us in the car, all our implements, even our pocket knives? But if we had not thrown them away, Pencroft, the balloon would have thrown us to the bottom of the sea, said Herbert. What you say is true, my boy, replied the sailor. Then, passing to another idea, think, said he, how astounded Jonathan Forster and his companions must have been when, next morning, they found the place empty and the machine flown away. I am utterly indifferent about knowing what they may have thought, said the reporter. It was all my idea that, said Pencroft, with a satisfied air. A splendid idea, Pencroft, replied Gideon Spilett, laughing, and which has placed us where we are. I would rather be here than in the hands of the southerners, cried the sailor, especially since the captain has been kind enough to come and join us again. So would I, truly, replied the reporter. Besides, what do we want? Nothing. If that is not everything, replied Pencroft, laughing and shrugging his shoulders, but some day or other we shall find means of going away. "'Sooner, perhaps, than you imagine, my friends,' remarked the engineer, "'if Lincoln Island is but a medium distance from an inhabited island, or from a continent. We shall know in an hour. I have not a map of the Pacific, but my memory has preserved a very clear recollection of its southern part. The latitude which I obtained yesterday placed New Zealand to the west of Lincoln Island, and the coast of Chile to the east. But between these two countries—' there is a distance of at least six thousand miles. It has therefore to be determined what point in this great space the island occupies, and this the longitude will give us presently, with a sufficient approximation, I hope. Is not the archipelago of the Pomatus the nearest point to us in latitude? asked Herbert. Yes, replied the engineer, but the distance which separates us from it is more than twelve hundred miles. "'And that way?' asked Neb, who followed the conversation with extreme interest, pointing to the south. "'That way nothing,' replied Pencroft. "'Nothing indeed,' added the engineer. "'Well, Cyrus,' asked the reporter, "'if Lincoln Island is not more than two or three thousand miles from New Zealand or Chile?' "'Well,' replied the engineer, Instead of building a house, we will build a boat, and Master Pencroft shall be put in command. Well, then, cried the sailor, I am quite ready to be captain, as soon as you can make a craft that's able to keep at sea. We shall do it, if it is necessary, replied Cyrus Harding. But while these men, who really hesitated at nothing, were talking, the hour approached at which the observation was to be made. What Cyrus Harding was to do to ascertain the passage of the sun at the meridian of the island, without an instrument of any sort, Herbert could not guess. The observers were then about six miles from the chimneys, not far from that part of the downs in which the engineer had been found after his enigmatical preservation. They halted at this place and prepared for breakfast, for it was half-past eleven. Herbert went for some fresh water from a stream which ran near, and brought it back in a jug which Neb had provided. During these preparations Harding arranged everything for his astronomical observation. He chose a clear place on the shore which the ebbing tide had left perfectly level. This bed of fine sand was as smooth as ice, not a grain out of place. It was of little importance whether it was horizontal or not and it did not matter much whether the stick, six feet high, which was planted there, rose perpendicularly. On the contrary, the engineer inclined it towards the south, that is to say, in the direction of the coast opposite to the sun, for it must not be forgotten that the settlers in Lincoln Island, as the island was situated in the southern hemisphere, saw the radiant planet describe its diurnal arc above the northern and not above the southern horizon. Herbert now understood how the engineer was going to proceed to ascertain the culmination of the sun, that is to say, its passing the meridian of the island, or in other words, determining due south. 
it was by means of the shadow cast on the sand by the stick, a way which, for want of an instrument, would give him a suitable approach to the result which he wished to obtain. In fact, the moment when this shadow would reach its minimum of length would be exactly twelve o'clock, and it would be enough to watch the extremity of the shadow, so as to ascertain the instant when, after having successively diminished, it began to lengthen. By inclining his stick to the side opposite to the sun, Cyrus Harding made the shadow longer, and consequently its modifications would be more easily ascertained. In fact, the longer the needle of a dial is, the more easily can the movement of its point be followed. The shadow of the stick was nothing but the needle of a dial. The moment had come, and Cyrus Harding knelt on the sand, and with little wooden pegs which he stuck into the sand, he began to mark the successive diminutions of the stick's shadow. His companions, bending over him, watched the operation with extreme interest. The reporter held his chronometer in his hand, ready to tell the hour which it marked when the shadow would be at its shortest. Moreover, as Cyrus Harding was working on the 16th of April, the day on which the true and the average time are identical, the hour given by Gideon Spilett would be the true hour then at Washington, which would simplify the calculation. Meanwhile, as the sun slowly advanced, the shadow slowly diminished, and when it appeared to Cyrus Harding that it was beginning to increase, he asked, What o'clock is it? One minute past five, replied Gideon Spilett directly. They had now only to calculate the operation. Nothing could be easier. It could be seen that there existed, in round numbers, a distance of five hours between the meridian of Washington and that of Lincoln Island. That is to say, it was midday in Lincoln Island when it was already five o'clock in the evening in Washington. Now the sun, in its apparent movement round the earth, traverses one degree in four minutes, or fifteen degrees an hour. Fifteen degrees multiplied by five hours gives seventy-five degrees. Then, since Washington is seventy-seven degrees three minutes eleven seconds, as much as to say seventy-seven degrees counted from the meridian of Greenwich, which the Americans take for their starting point for longitudes concurrently with the English, it followed that the island must be situated seventy-seven and seventy-five degrees west of the meridian of Greenwich, that is to say, on the hundred and fifty-second degree of west longitude. Cyrus Harding announced this result to his companions, and taking into consideration errors of observation, as he had done for the latitude, he believed he could positively affirm that the position of Lincoln Island was between the thirty-fifth and the thirty-seventh parallel, and between the hundred and fiftieth and the hundred and fifty-fifth meridian to the west of the meridian of Greenwich. The possible fault which he attributed to errors in the observation was, it may be seen, of five degrees on both sides, which, at sixty miles to a degree, would give an error of three hundred miles in latitude and longitude for the exact position. But this error would not influence the determination which it was necessary to take. It was very evident that Lincoln Island was at such a distance from every country or island that it would be too hazardous to attempt to reach one in a frail boat. In fact, this calculation placed it at least twelve hundred miles from Tahiti and the islands of the archipelago of the Pomatus, more than eighteen hundred miles from New Zealand, and more than four thousand five hundred miles from the American coast. And when Cyrus Harding consulted his memory, he could not remember in any way that such an island occupied in that part of the Pacific, the situation assigned to Lincoln Island. End of chapter. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, Part 1, Chapter 15. The next day, the 17th of April, the sailor's first words were addressed to Gideon Spilett. "'Well, sir,' he asked, "'what shall we do today?' "'What the captain pleases,' 
replied the reporter. Till then the engineers' companions had been brickmakers and potters. Now they were to become metallurgists. The day before, after breakfast, they had explored as far as the point of Mandible Cape, seven miles distant from the chimneys. There the long series of downs ended, and the soil had a volcanic appearance. There were no longer high cliffs as at Prospect Heights, but a strange and capricious border which surrounded the narrow gulf between the two capes, formed of mineral matter thrown up by the volcano. Arrived at this point, the settlers retraced their steps, and at nightfall entered the chimneys, but they did not sleep before the question of knowing whether they could think of leaving Lincoln Island or not was definitely settled. The twelve hundred miles which separated the island from the Pomatus Island was a considerable distance. A boat could not cross it, especially at the approach of the bad season. Pencroft had expressly declared this. Now, to construct a simple boat, even with the necessary tools, was a difficult work, and the colonists not having tools they must begin by making hammers, axes, adzes, saws, augers, planes, etc., which would take some time. It was decided, therefore, that they would winter at Lincoln Island, and that they would look for a more comfortable dwelling than the chimneys in which to pass the winter months. Before anything else could be done, it was necessary to make the iron ore, of which the engineer had observed some traces in the northwest part of the island, fit for use by converting it either into iron or into steel. Metals are not generally found in the ground in a pure state. For the most part they are combined with oxygen or sulphur. Such was the case with the two specimens which Cyrus Harding had brought back, one of magnetic iron, not carbonated, the other a pyrite, also called sulphuret of iron. It was therefore the first, the oxide of iron, which they must reduce with coal, that is to say, get rid of the oxygen, to obtain it in a pure state. This reduction is made by subjecting the ore with coal to a high temperature, either by the rapid and easy Catalan method, which has the advantage of transforming the ore into iron in a single operation, or by the blast furnace, which first smelts the ore, then changes it into iron, by carrying away the three to four percent of coal which is combined with it. Now Cyrus Harding wanted iron, and he wanted to obtain it as soon as possible. The ore which he had picked up was in itself very pure and rich. It was the oxygelous iron, which is found in confused masses of a deep gray color. It gives a black dust, crystallized in the form of the regular octahedron. Native lodestones consist of this ore, and iron of the first quality is made in Europe from that with which Sweden and Norway are so abundantly supplied. Not far from this vein was the vein of coal already made use of by the settlers. The ingredients for the manufacture being close together would greatly facilitate the treatment of the ore. This is the cause of the wealth of the mines in Great Britain, where the coal aids the manufacture of the metal extracted from the same soil at the same time as itself. "'Then, Captain,' said Pencroft, "'we are going to work iron ore?' "'Yes, my friend,' replied the engineer, "'and for that, something which will please you.' we must begin by having a seal-hunt on the islet. "'A seal-hunt!' cried the sailor, turning towards Gideon Spilett. "'Are seals needed to make iron?' "'Since Cyrus has said so,' replied the reporter. But the engineer had already left the chimneys, and Pencroft prepared for the seal-hunt, without having received any other explanation. Cyrus Harding, Herbert, Gideon Spilett, Neb, and the sailor were soon collected on the shore, at a place where the channel left a ford passable at low tide. The hunters could therefore traverse it without getting wet higher than the knee. Harding then put his foot on the islet for the first, and his companions for the second time. On their landing some hundreds of penguins looked fearlessly at them. The hunters, armed with sticks, could have killed them easily, but they were not guilty of such useless massacre, as it was important not to frighten the seals who were lying on the sand several cable-lengths off. They also respected certain innocent-looking birds, 
whose wings were reduced to the state of stumps, spread out like fins, ornamented with feathers of a scaly appearance. The settlers, therefore, prudently advanced towards the north point, walking over ground riddled with little holes, which formed nests for the sea-birds. Towards the extremity of the islet appeared great black heads floating just above the water, having exactly the appearance of rocks in motion. These were the seals which were to be captured. It was necessary, however, first to allow them to land, for with their close short hair and their fusiform conformation, being excellent swimmers, it is difficult to catch them in the sea, while on land their short webbed feet prevent their having more than a slow waddling movement. Pencroft knew the habits of these creatures, and he advised waiting till they were stretched on the sand, when the sun before long would send them to sleep. They must then manage to cut off their retreat and knock them on the head. The hunters, having concealed themselves behind the rocks, waited silently. An hour passed before the seals came to play on the sand. They could count half a dozen. Pencroft and Herbert then went round the point of the islet, so as to take them in the rear and cut off their retreat. During this time Cyrus Harding, Spilett, and Neb, crawling behind the rocks, glided toward the future scene of combat. All at once the tall figure of the sailor appeared. Pencroft shouted. The engineer and his two companions threw themselves between the sea and the seals. Two of the animals soon lay dead on the sand, but the rest regained the sea in safety. "'Here are the seals required, Captain,' said the sailor, advancing towards the engineer. "'Capital,' replied Harding. "'We will make bellows of them.' "'Bellows!' cried Pencroft. "'Well, these are lucky seals.' It was, in fact, a blowing machine, necessary for the treatment of the ore that the engineer wished to manufacture with the skins of the amphibious creatures. They were of a medium size, for their length did not exceed six feet. They resembled a dog about the head. As it was useless to burden themselves with the weight of both the animals, Neb and Pencroft resolved to skin them on the spot, while Cyrus Harding and the reporter continued to explore the islet. The sailor and the negro cleverly performed the operation, and three hours afterwards Cyrus Harding had at his disposal two seal skins, which he intended to use in this state, without subjecting them to any tanning process. The settlers waited till the tide was again low, and crossing the channel they entered the chimneys. The skins had then to be stretched on a frame of wood, and sewn by means of fibres, so as to preserve the air without allowing too much to escape. Cyrus Harding had nothing but the two steel blades from Top's collar, and yet he was so clever, and his companions aided him with so much intelligence, that three days afterwards the little colony's stock of tools was augmented by a blowing machine, destined to inject the air into the midst of the ore when it should be subjected to heat, an indispensable condition to the success of the operation. On the morning of the 20th of April began the metallic period, as the reporter called it in his notes. The engineer had decided, as has been said, to operate near the veins both of coal and ore. Now, according to his observations, these veins were situated at the foot of the northeast spurs of Mount Franklin, that is to say, a distance of six miles from their home. It was impossible, therefore, to return every day to the chimneys and it was agreed that the little colony should camp under a hut of branches, so that the important operation could be followed night and day. This settled, they set out in the morning. Neb and Pencroft dragged the bellows on a hurdle, also a quantity of vegetables and animals, which they besides could renew on the way. The road led through Jacamar Wood, which they traversed obliquely from southeast to northwest, and in the thickest part. It was necessary to beat a path, which would in the future form the most direct road to Prospect Heights and Mount Franklin. The trees, belonging to the species already discovered, were magnificent. Herbert found some new ones, among others some which Pencroft called sham leeks, for in spite of their size they were of the same liliaceous family as the onion, chive, shallot, or asparagus. 
These trees produce ligneous roots, which, when cooked, are excellent. From them, by fermentation, a very agreeable liquor is made. They therefore made a good store of the roots. The journey through the wood was long. It lasted the whole day, and so allowed plenty of time for examining the flora and fauna. Top, who took special charge of the fauna, ran through the grass and brushwood, putting up all sorts of game. Herbert and Gideon Spillet killed two kangaroos with bows and arrows, and also an animal which strongly resembled both a hedgehog and an anteater. It was like the first because it rolled itself into a ball and bristled with spines, and the second because it had sharp claws, a long slender snout which terminated in a bird's beak, and an extendable tongue covered with little thorns which served to hold the insects. "'And when it is in the pot,' asked Pencroft naturally, "'what will it be like?' "'An excellent piece of beef,' replied Herbert. "'We will not ask more from it,' replied the sailor. During this excursion they saw several wild boars, which, however, did not offer to attack the little band, and it appeared as if they would not meet with any dangerous beasts, when, in a thick part of the wood, the reporter thought he saw, some paces from him, among the lower branches of a tree, an animal which he took for a bear, and which he very tranquilly began to draw. Happily for Gideon Spilett, the animal in question did not belong to the redoubtable family of the plantigrades. It was only a koala, better known under the name of the sloth, being about the size of a large dog, and having stiff hair of a dirty color. The paws armed with strong claws, which enabled it to climb trees and feed on the leaves. Having identified the animal, which they did not disturb, Gideon Spilett erased Bear from the title of his sketch, putting Koala in its place, and the journey was resumed. At five o'clock in the evening Cyrus Harding gave the signal to halt. They were now outside the forest, at the beginning of the powerful spurs which supported Mount Franklin towards the west. At a distance of some hundred feet flowed the Red Creek, and consequently plenty of fresh water was within their reach. The camp was soon organized. In less than an hour, on the edge of the forest, among the trees, a hut of branches interlaced with creepers and pasted over with clay offered a tolerable shelter. Their geological researches were put off till the next day. Supper was prepared, a good fire blazed before the hut, the roast turned, and at eight o'clock, while one of the settlers watched to keep up the fire, in case any wild beasts should prowl in the neighborhood, the others slept soundly. The next day, the 21st of April, Cyrus Harding, accompanied by Herbert, went to look for the soil of ancient formation, on which he had already discovered a specimen of ore. They found the vein above ground, near the source of the creek, at the foot of one of the northeastern spurs. This ore, very rich in iron, enclosed in its fusible veinstone, was perfectly suited to the mode of reduction which the engineer intended to employ, that is, the Catalan method, but simplified, as it is used in Corsica. In fact, the Catalan method, properly so called, requires the construction of kilns and crucibles, in which the ore and the coal, placed in alternate layers, are transformed and reduced. But Cyrus Harding intended to concentrate these constructions, and wished simply to form, with the ore and the coal, a cubic mass, to the center of which he would direct the wind from his bellows. Doubtless it was the proceeding employed by Tubal Cain, and the first metallurgist of the inhabited world. Now that which had succeeded with the grandson of Adam, and which still yielded good results in countries rich in ore and fuel, could not but succeed with the settlers in Lincoln Island. The coal, as well as the ore, was collected without trouble on the surface of the ground. They first broke the ore into little pieces, and cleansed them with the hand from the impurities which soiled their surface. Then coal and ore were arranged in heaps, and in successive layers, as the charcoal burner does with the wood which he wishes to carbonize. In this way, under the influence of the air projected by the blowing machine, the coal would be transformed into carbonic acid, then into oxide of carbon 
its use being to reduce the oxide of iron, that is to say, to rid it of the oxygen. Thus the engineer proceeded. The bellows of sealskin, furnished at its extremity with a nozzle of clay, which had been previously fabricated in the pottery kiln, was established near the heap of ore. Using the mechanism which consisted of a frame, cords of fibre, and counterpoise, he threw into the mass an abundance of air, which by raising the temperature also concurred with the chemical transformation to produce in time pure iron. The operation was difficult. All the patience, all the ingenuity of the settlers was needed, but at last it succeeded, and the result was a lump of iron reduced to a spongy state, which it was necessary to shingle and faggot, that is to say, to forge so as to expel from it the liquefied veinstone. These amateur smiths had, of course, no hammer, but they were in no worse a situation than the first metallurgist, and therefore did what, no doubt, he had to do. A handle was fixed to the first lump, and was used as a hammer to forge the second on a granite anvil, and thus they obtained a coarse but useful metal. At length, after many trials and much fatigue, on the 25th of April several bars of iron were forged, and transformed into tools, crowbars, pincers, pickaxes, spades, etc., which Pencroft and Neb declared to be real jewels. But the metal was not yet in its most serviceable state, that is, of steel. Now steel is a combination of iron and coal, which is extracted either from the liquid ore, by taking from it the excess of coal, or from the iron by adding to it the coal which was wanting. The first, obtained by the decarburation of the metal, gives natural or puddled steel. The second, produced by the carburation of the iron, give steel of cementation. It was the last which Cyrus Harding intended to forge, as he possessed iron in a pure state. He succeeded by heating the metal with powdered coal in a crucible which had previously been manufactured from clay suitable for the purpose. He then worked this steel, which is malleable both when hot or cold, with the hammer. Neb and Pencroft, cleverly directed, made hatchets, which, heated red-hot, and plunge suddenly into cold water, acquired an excellent temper. Other instruments, of course roughly fashioned, were also manufactured, blades for planes, axes, hatchets, pieces of steel to be transformed into saws, chisels, then iron for spades, pickaxes, hammers, nails, etc. At last, on the 5th of May, the metallic period ended, the smiths returned to the chimneys, and new work would soon authorize them to take a fresh title. End of chapter. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part 1, Chapter 16 It was the 6th of May, a day which corresponds to the 6th of November in the countries of the Northern Hemisphere, the sky had been obscured for some days, and it was of importance to make preparations for the winter. However, the temperature was not as yet much lower, and a centigrade thermometer, transported to Lincoln Island, would still have marked an average of ten to twelve degrees above zero. This was not surprising, since Lincoln Island, probably situated between the thirty-fifth and fortieth parallel, would be subject, in the southern hemisphere, to the same climate as Sicily or Greece in the northern hemisphere. But as Greece and Sicily have severe cold producing snow and ice, so doubtless would Lincoln Island in the severest part of the winter, and it was advisable to provide against it. In any case, if cold did not yet threaten them, the rainy season would begin, and on this lonely island, exposed to all the fury of the elements, in mid-ocean, bad weather would be frequent and probably terrible. The question of a more comfortable dwelling than the chimneys must therefore be seriously considered and promptly resolved on. Pencroft naturally had some predilection for the retreat which he had discovered, but he well understood that another must be found. The chimneys had already been visited by the sea, under circumstances which are known, and it would not do to be exposed again to a similar accident. Besides, 
added Cyrus Harding, who this day was talking of these things with his companions, we have some precautions to take. Why, the island is not inhabited, said the reporter. That is probable, replied the engineer, although we have not yet explored the interior. But if no human beings are found, I fear that dangerous animals may abound. It is necessary to guard against a possible attack, so that we shall not be obliged to watch every night, or to keep up a fire. And then, my friends, we must foresee everything. We are here in a part of the Pacific often frequented by Malay pirates. What? said Herbert. At such a distance from land? Yes, my boy, replied the engineer. These pirates are bold sailors as well as formidable enemies, and we must take measures accordingly. Well, replied Pencroft, we will fortify ourselves against savages with two legs as well as against savages with four. But, Captain, will it not be best to explore every part of the island before undertaking anything else? That would be best, added Gideon Spilett. Who knows if we might not find on the opposite side one of the caverns which we have searched for in vain here? That is true, replied the engineer. But you forget, my friends, that it will be necessary to establish ourselves in the neighborhood of a watercourse, and that, from the summit of Mount Franklin, we could not see towards the west either stream or river. Here, on the contrary, we are placed between the Mercy and Lake Grant, an advantage which must not be neglected. And besides, this side, looking towards the east, is not exposed as the other is to the trade winds, which in this hemisphere blow from the northwest. Then, Captain, replied the sailor, let us build a house on the edge of the lake. Neither bricks nor tools are wanting now. After having been brickmakers, potters, smelters, and smiths, we shall surely know how to be masons. Yes, my friend, but before coming to any decision we must consider the matter thoroughly. A natural dwelling would spare us much work, and would be a surer retreat, for it would be as well defended against enemies from the interior as those from outside. That is true, Cyrus, replied the reporter, but we have already examined all that mass of granite, and there is not a hole, not a cranny. No, not one, added Pencroft. Ah, uh, if we were able to dig out a dwelling in that cliff, at a good height, so as to be out of the reach of harm, that would be capital. I can see that on the front which looks seaward. Five or six rooms. With windows to light them, said Herbert, laughing. And a staircase to climb up to them, added Neb. You are laughing, cried the sailor, and why? What is there impossible in what I propose? Haven't we got pickaxes and spades? Won't Captain Harding be able to make powder to blow up the mine? Isn't it true, Captain, that you will make powder the very day we want it? Cyrus Harding listened to the enthusiastic Pencroft developing his fanciful projects. To attack this mass of granite, even by a mine, was Herculean work, and it was really vexing that nature could not help them at their need. But the engineer did not reply to the sailor except by proposing to examine the cliff more attentively, from the mouth of the river to the angle which terminated it on the north. They went out, therefore, and the exploration was made with extreme care over an extent of nearly two miles. But in no place in the bare, straight cliff could any cavity be found. The nests of the rock pigeons which fluttered at its summit were only, in reality, holes bored at the very top and on the irregular edge of the granite. It was a provoking circumstance, and as to attacking this cliff, either with pickaxe or with powder, so as to effect a sufficient excavation, it was not to be thought of. It so happened that, on all this part of the shore, Pencroft had discovered the only habitable shelter, that is to say, the chimneys, which now had to be abandoned. The exploration ended. The colonists found themselves at the north angle of the cliff, where it terminated in long slopes which died away on the shore. From this place, to its extreme limit in the west, it only formed a sort of declivity, a thick mass of stones, earth, and sand, bound together by plants, bushes, and grass, 
inclined at an angle of only forty-five degrees. Clumps of trees grew on these slopes, which were also carpeted with thick grass. But the vegetation did not extend far, and a long, sandy plain, which began at the foot of these slopes, reached to the beach. Cyrus Harding thought, not without reason, that the overplus of the lake must overflow on this side. The excess of water furnished by the Red Creek must also escape by some channel or other. Now the engineer had not yet found this channel on any part of the shore already explored, that is to say, from the mouth of the stream on the west of Prospect Heights. The engineer now proposed to his companions to climb the slope, and to return to the chimneys by the heights, while exploring the northern and eastern shores of the lake. The proposal was accepted, and in a few minutes Herbert and Neb were on the upper plateau. Cyrus Harding, Gideon Spilett, and Pencroft followed with more sedate steps. The beautiful sheet of water glittered through the trees under the rays of the sun. In this direction the country was charming. The eye feasted on the groups of trees. Some old trunks, bent with age, showed black against the verdant grass which covered the ground. Crowds of brilliant cockatoos screamed among the branches, moving prisms, hopping from one bough to another. The settlers, instead of going directly to the north bank of the lake, made a circuit round the edge of the plateau, so as to join the mouth of the creek on its left bank. It was a detour of more than a mile and a half. Walking was easy, for the trees, widely spread, left a considerable space between them. The fertile zone evidently stopped at this point, and vegetation would be less vigorous in the part between the course of the creek and the Mercy. Cyrus Harding and his companions walked over this new ground with great care. Bows, arrows, and sticks with sharp iron points were their only weapons. However, no wild beast showed itself, and it was probable that these animals frequented, rather, the thick forests in the south. But the settlers had the disagreeable surprise of seeing top stop before a snake of great size, measuring from fourteen to fifteen feet in length. Neb killed it by a blow from his stick. Cyrus Harding examined the reptile, and declared it not venomous, for it belonged to that species of diamond serpents which the natives of New South Wales rear. But it was possible that others existed whose bite was mortal, such as the deaf vipers with forked tails, which rise up under the feet, or those winged snakes, furnished with two ears, which enable them to proceed with great rapidity. Top, the first moment of surprise over, began a reptile chase with such eagerness that they feared for his safety. His master called him back directly. The mouth of the Red Creek, at the place where it entered into the lake, was soon reached. The explorers recognized on the opposite shore the point which they had visited on their descent from Mount Franklin. Cyrus Harding ascertained that the flow of water into it from the creek was considerable. Nature must, therefore, have provided some place for the escape of the overplus. This doubtless formed a fall which, if it could be discovered, would be of great use. The colonists, walking apart, but not straying far from each other, began to skirt the edge of the lake, which was very steep. The water appeared to be full of fish, and Pencroft resolved to make some fishing rods, so as to try and catch some. The northeast point was first to be doubled. It might have been supposed that the discharge of water was at this place, for the extremity of the lake was almost on a level with the edge of the plateau but no signs of this were discovered, and the colonists continued to explore the bank, which, after a slight bend, descended parallel to the shore. On this side the banks were less woody, but clumps of trees here and there added to the picturesqueness of the country. Lake Grant was viewed from thence in all its extent, and no breath disturbed the surface of its waters. Top, in beating the bushes, put up flocks of birds of different kinds, which Gideon Spilett and Herbert saluted with arrows. One was hit by the lad, and fell into some marshy grass. Top rushed forward, and brought a beautiful swimming bird of a slate color, short beak, 
very developed frontal plate, and wings edged with white. It was a coot, the size of a large partridge, belonging to the group of macrodactyls which form the transition between the order of wading birds and that of palmipeds. Sorry game, in truth, and its flavour is far from pleasant. But Top was not so particular in these things as his master's, and it was agreed that the coot should be for his supper. The settlers were now following the eastern bank of the lake, and they would not be long in reaching the part which they already knew. The engineer was much surprised at not seeing any indication of the discharge of water. The reporter and the sailor talked with him, and he could not conceal his astonishment. At this moment Top, who had been very quiet till then, gave signs of agitation. The intelligent animal went backwards and forwards on the shore, stopped suddenly, and looked at the water, one paw raised, as if he was pointing at some invisible game. Then he barked furiously and was suddenly silent. Neither Cyrus Harding nor his companions had at first paid any attention to Top's behaviour, but the dog's barking soon became so frequent that the engineer noticed it. "'What is there there, Top?' he asked. The dog bounded towards his master, seeming to be very uneasy, and then rushed again towards the bank. Then all at once he plunged into the lake. "'Here, Top!' cried Cyrus Harding, who did not like his dog to venture into the treacherous water. "'What's happening down there?' asked Pencroft, examining the surface of the lake. "'Top smells some amphibious creature,' replied Herbert. "'An alligator, perhaps,' said the reporter. "'I do not think so,' replied Harding. "'Alligators are only met with in regions less elevated in latitude.' Meanwhile Top had returned at his master's call, and had regained the shore. But he could not stay quiet. He plunged in among the tall grass, and, guided by instinct, he appeared to follow some invisible being which was slipping along under the surface of the water. However, the water was calm. Not a ripple disturbed its surface. Several times the settler stopped on the bank and observed it attentively. Nothing appeared there was some mystery there. The engineer was puzzled. "'Let us pursue this exploration to the end,' said he. Half an hour after, they had all arrived at the southeast angle of the lake, on Prospect Heights. At this point the examination of the banks of the lake was considerably finished, and yet the engineer had not been able to discover how and where the waters were discharged. There is no doubt this overflow exists, he repeated, and since it is not visible it must go through a granite cliff at the west. But what importance do you attach to knowing that, my dear Cyrus? asked Gideon Spilett. Considerable importance, replied the engineer, for if it flows through the cliff there is probably some cavity, which it would be easy to render habitable after turning away the water. "'But is it not possible, Captain, that the water flows away at the bottom of the lake,' said Herbert, "'and that it reaches the sea by some subterranean passage?' "'That might be,' replied the engineer. "'And should it be so, we shall be obliged to build our house ourselves, since nature has not done it for us.' The colonists were about to begin to traverse the plateau to return to the chimneys, when Top gave new signs of agitation. He barked with fury, and before his master could restrain him, he had plunged a second time into the lake. All ran towards the bank. The dog was already more than twenty feet off, and Cyrus was calling him back, when an enormous head emerged from the water, which did not appear to be deep in that place. Herbert recognized directly the species of amphibian to which the tapering head, with large eyes, and adorned with long, silky moustaches, belonged. A lamantin! he cried. It was not a lamantin, but one of that species of the order of cetaceans, which bear the name of the dugong, for its nostrils were open at the upper part of its snout. The enormous animal rushed on the dog, who tried to escape by returning towards the shore. His master could do nothing to save him, and before Gideon Spilett or Herbert thought of bending their bows, Top, seized by the dugong, had disappeared beneath the water. 
Neb, his iron-tipped spear in his hand, wished to go to Top's help, and attack the dangerous animal in its own element. "'No, Neb,' said the engineer, restraining his courageous servant. Meanwhile a struggle was going on beneath the water, an inexplicable struggle, for in his situation Top could not possibly resist and judging by the bubbling of the surface it must also be a terrible struggle, and could not but terminate in the death of the dog. But suddenly, in the middle of a foaming circle, Top reappeared. Thrown in the air by some unknown power, he rose ten feet above the surface of the lake, fell again into the midst of the agitated waters, and then soon gained the shore, without any severe wounds, miraculously saved. Cyrus Harding and his companions could not understand it. What was not less inexplicable was that the struggle still appeared to be going on. Doubtless the dugong, attacked by some powerful animal, after having released the dog, was fighting on its own account. But it did not last long. The water became red with blood, and the body of the dugong, emerging from the sheet of scarlet which spread around, soon stranded on a little beach at the south angle of the lake. The colonists ran towards it. The dugong was dead. It was an enormous animal, fifteen or sixteen feet long, and must have weighed from three to four thousand pounds. At its neck was a wound, which appeared to have been produced by a sharp blade. What could the amphibious creature have been, who, by this terrible blow, had destroyed the formidable dugong? No one could tell, and much interested in this incident, Harding and his companions returned to the chimneys. End of chapter The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part One, Chapter Seventeen The next day, the 7th of May, Harding and Gideon Spilett, leaving Neb to prepare breakfast, climbed Prospect Heights, while Herbert and Pencroft ascended by the river to renew their store of wood. The engineer and the reporter soon reached the little beach on which the dugong had been stranded. Already flocks of birds had attacked the mass of flesh, and had to be driven away with stones, for Cyrus wished to keep the fat for the use of the colony. As to the animal's flesh, it would furnish excellent food, for in the islands of the Malay archipelago and elsewhere. It is especially reserved for the table of the native princes, but that was Neb's affair. At this moment Cyrus Harding had other thoughts. He was much interested in the incident of the day before. He wished to penetrate the mystery of that submarine combat, and to ascertain what monster could have given the dugong so strange a wound. He remained at the edge of the lake, looking, observing. But nothing appeared under the tranquil waters which sparkled in the first rays of the rising sun. At the beach, on which lay the body of the dugong, the water was tolerably shallow, but from this point the bottom of the lake sloped gradually, and it was probable that the depth was considerable in the center. The lake might be considered as a large center basin, which was filled by the water from the Red Creek. "'Well, Cyrus,' said the reporter, "'there seems to be nothing suspicious in this water.' "'No, my dear Spilett,' replied the engineer, "'and I really do not know how to account for the incident of yesterday.' "'I acknowledge,' returned Spilett, "'that the wound given this creature is at least very strange, "'and I cannot explain either how Top was so vigorously cast up out of the water. "'One could have thought that a powerful arm hurled him up, "'and that the same arm with a dagger killed the dugong.' Yes, replied the engineer, who had become thoughtful. There is something there that I cannot understand. But do you better understand either, my dear Spilett, in what way I was saved myself? How I was drawn from the waves and carried to the downs? No! Is it not true? Now, I feel sure that there is some mystery there, which doubtless we shall discover some day. Let us observe. But do not dwell on these singular incidents before our companions. Let us keep our remarks to ourselves, and continue our work. 
it will be remembered that the engineer had not as yet been able to discover the place where the surplus water escaped, but he knew it must exist somewhere. He was much surprised to see a strong current at this place. By throwing in some bits of wood he found that it set towards the southern angle. He followed the current, and arrived at the south point of the lake. There was there a, a sort of depression in the water, as if it was suddenly lost in some fissure in the ground. Harding listened. Placing his ear to the level of the lake, he very distinctly heard the noise of a subterranean fall. There, said he, rising, is the discharge of the water. There, doubtless, by a passage in the granite cliff, it joins the sea, through cavities which we can use to our profit. Well, I can find it. The engineer cut a long branch, stripped it of its leaves, and plunging it into the angle between the two banks, he found that there was a large hole, one foot only, beneath the surface of the water. This hole was the opening so long looked for in vain, and the force of the current was such that the branch was torn from the engineer's hands and disappeared. "'There is no doubt about it now,' repeated Harding. "'There is the outlet, and I will lay it open to view.' "'How?' asked Gideon Spillet. "'By lowering the level of the water of the lake three feet.' "'And how will you lower the level?' "'By opening another outlet larger than this.' At what place, Cyrus? At the part of the bank nearest the coast. But it is a mass of granite, observed Spilett. Well, replied Cyrus Harding, I will blow up the granite, and the water escaping will subside, so as to lay bare this opening. And make a waterfall by falling on to the beach, added the reporter. A fall that we shall make use of, replied Cyrus. Come, come. The engineer hurried away his companion, whose confidence in Harding was such that he did not doubt the enterprise would succeed. And yet how was this granite wall to be opened without powder, and with imperfect instruments? Was not this work upon which the engineer was so bent above their strength? When Harding and the reporter entered the chimneys, they found Herbert and Pencroft unloading their raft of wood. "'The woodmen have just finished, Captain.' said the sailor, laughing. "'And when you want masons—' "'Masons, no, but chemist,' replied the engineer. "'Yes,' added the reporter. "'We are going to blow up the island.' "'Blow up the island!' cried Pencroft. "'A part of it, at least,' replied Spilett. "'Listen to me, my friends,' said the engineer, and he made known to them the result of his observations. According to him, a cavity— more or less considerable, must exist in the mass of granite which supported Prospect Heights, and he intended to penetrate into it. To do this, the opening through which the water rushed must first be cleared, and the level lowered by making a larger outlet. Therefore an explosive substance must be manufactured, which would make a deep trench in some other part of the shore. This was what Harding was going to attempt with the minerals which nature placed at his disposal. It is useless to say with what enthusiasm all, especially Pencroft, received this project. To employ great means, open the granite, create a cascade, that suited the sailor. And he would just as soon be a chemist as a mason or bootmaker, since the engineer wanted chemicals. He would be all that they liked, even a professor of dancing and deportment, said he to Neb, if that was ever necessary. Neb and Pencroft were first of all told to extract the grease from the dugong, and to keep the flesh, which was destined for food. Such perfect confidence had they in the engineer, that they set out directly, without even asking a question. A few minutes after them, Cyrus Harding, Herbert, and Gideon Spilett, dragging the hurdle, went towards the vein of coals, where whose schistos pyrites abound which are met with in the most recent transition soil and of which Harding had already found a specimen. All the day being employed in carrying a quantity of these stones to the chimneys, by evening they had several tons. The next day, the 8th of May, the engineer began his manipulations. These schistos pyrites, being composed principally of coal, flint, alumina, and sulphuret of iron, 
the latter in excess, it was necessary to separate the sulphuret of iron, and transform it into sulphate as rapidly as possible. The sulphate obtained, the sulphuric acid could then be extracted. This was the object to be attained. Sulphuric acid is one of the agents the most frequently employed, and the manufacturing importance of a nation can be measured by the consumption which is made of it. This acid would later be of great use to the settlers in the manufacturing of candles, tanning skins, etc., but this time the engineer reserved it for another use. Cyrus Harding chose, behind the chimneys, a site where the ground was perfectly level. On this ground he placed a layer of branches and chopped wood, on which were piled some pieces of schistos pyrites, buttressed one against the other, and the whole, being covered with a thin layer of pyrites, previously reduced to the size of a nut. This done, they set fire to the wood. The heat was communicated to the schist, which soon kindled, since it contains coal and sulphur. Then new layers of bruised pyrites were arranged so as to form an immense heap, the exterior of which was covered with earth and grass, several air holes being left, as if it was a stack of wood which was to be carbonized to make charcoal. They then left the transformation to complete itself, and it would not take less than ten or twelve days for the sulphuret of iron to be changed to sulphate of iron, and the alumina into sulphate of alumina, two equally soluble substances, the others, flint, burnt coal, and cinders, not being so. While this chemical work was going on, Cyrus Harding proceeded with other operations, which were pursued with more than zeal. It was eagerness. Neb and Pencroft had taken away the fat from the dugong, and placed it in large earthen pots. It was then necessary to separate the glycerin from the fat by saponifying it. Now, to obtain this result, it had to be treated either with soda or lime. In fact, one or other of these substances, after having attacked the fat, would form a soap by separating the glycerin, and it was just this glycerin which the engineer wished to obtain. There was no want of lime. Only treatment by lime would give calcareous soap, insoluble and consequently useless, while treatment by soda would furnish, on the contrary, a soluble soap which could be put to domestic use. Now a practical man, like Cyrus Harding, would rather try to obtain soda. Was this difficult? No, for marine plants abounded on the shore, glasswort, ficoides, and all those fucaceae which form rack. A large quantity of these plants was collected, first dried, then burnt in holes in the open air. The combustion of these plants was kept up for several days, and the result was a compact gray mass which has long been known under the name of natural soda. This obtained, the engineer treated the fat with soda, which gave both the soluble soap and that neutral substance, glycerin. But this was not all. Cyrus Harding still needed, in view of his future preparation, another substance, nitrate of potash, which is better known under the name of salt niter, or of saltpeter. Cyrus Harding could have manufactured this substance by treating the carbonate of potash, which would be easily extracted from the cinders of the vegetables, by azotic acid. But this acid was wanting, and he would have been in some difficulty, if nature had not happily furnished the saltpeter, without giving them any other trouble than that of picking it up. Herbert found a vein of it at the foot of Mount Franklin, and they had nothing to do but purify this salt. These different works lasted a week. They were finished before the transformation of the sulphuret into sulphate of iron had been accomplished. During the following days, the settlers had time to construct a furnace of bricks of a particular arrangement, to serve for the distillation of the sulphate of iron when it had been obtained. All this was finished about the 18th of May, nearly at the time when the chemical transformation terminated. Gideon Spilett, Herbert, Neb, and Pencroft, skillfully directed by the engineer, had become most clever workmen. Before all masters, necessity is the one most listened to, and who teaches the best. 
When the heap of pyrites had been entirely reduced by fire, the result of the operation, consisting of sulphate of iron, sulphate of alumina, flint, remains of coal, and cinders, was placed in a basin full of water. They stirred this mixture, let it settle, then decanted it, and obtained a clear liquid containing in solution sulphate of iron and sulphate of alumina, the other matters remaining solid since they are insoluble. Lastly, this liquid being partly evaporated, crystals of sulphate of iron were deposited, and the not evaporated liquid, which contained the sulphate of alumina, was thrown away. Cyrus Harding had now at his disposal a large quantity of these sulphate of iron crystals, from which the sulphuric acid had to be extracted. The making of sulphuric acid is a very expensive manufacture. Considerable works are necessary. A special set of tools, an apparatus of platina, leaden chambers, unassailable by the acid, and in which the transformation is performed, etc. <laughs> the engineer had none of these at his disposal, but he knew that, in Bohemia especially, sulphuric acid is manufactured by very simple means which have also the advantage of producing it to a superior degree of concentration. It is thus that the acid known under the name of Nordhausen acid is made. To obtain sulphuric acid, Cyrus Harding had only one operation to make, to calcine the sulphate of iron crystals in a closed vase, so that the sulphuric acid should distill in vapor, which vapor, by condensation, would produce the acid. The crystals were placed in pots, and the heat from the furnace would distill the sulphuric acid. The operation was successfully completed, and on the 20th of May, twelve days after commencing it, the engineer was the possessor of the agent which later he hoped to use in so many different ways. Now, why did he wish for this agent? Simply to produce azotic acid, and that was easy, since saltpeter, attacked by sulphuric acid, gives azotic, or nitric, acid by distillation. But, after all, how was he going to employ this azotic acid? His companions were still ignorant of this, for he had not informed them of the result at which he aimed. However, the engineer had nearly accomplished his purpose, and by a last operation he would procure the substance which had given so much trouble. Taking some azotic acid, he mixed it with glycerin, which had been previously concentrated by evaporation, subjected to the water bath, and he obtained, without even employing a refrigerant mixture, several pints of an oily yellow mixture. This last operation Cyrus Harding had made alone, in a retired place, at a distance from the chimneys, for he feared the danger of an explosion, and when he showed a bottle of this liquid to his friends, he contented himself with saying, here is nitroglycerin. It was really this terrible production, of which the explosive power is perhaps tenfold that of ordinary powder, and which has already caused so many accidents. However, since a way has been found to transform it into dynamite, that is to say, to mix it with some solid substance, clay or sugar, porous enough to hold it, the dangerous liquid has been used with some security. But dynamite was not yet known at the time when the settlers worked on Lincoln Island. "'And is it that liquid that is going to blow up our rocks?' said Pencroft incredulously. "'Yes, my friend,' replied the engineer. "'And this nitroglycerin will produce so much the more effect, as the granite is extremely hard, and will oppose a greater resistance to the explosion.' "'And when shall we see this, Captain?' "'Tomorrow.' as soon as we have dug a hole for the mine," replied the engineer. The next day, the 21st of May, at daybreak, the miners went to the point which formed the eastern shore of Lake Grant, and was only five hundred feet from the coast. At this place the plateau inclined downwards from the waters, which were only restrained by their granite case. Therefore, if this case was broken, the water would escape by the opening and form a stream which, flowing over the inclined surface of the plateau, would rush on to the beach. Consequently, the level of the lake would be greatly lowered, and the opening where the water escaped would be exposed, 
which was their final aim. Under the engineer's directions, Pencroft, armed with a pickaxe, which he handled skillfully and vigorously, attacked the granite. The hole was made on the point of the shore, slanting, so that it should meet a much lower level than that of the water of the lake. In this way the explosive force, by scattering the rock, would open a large place for the water to rush out. The work took some time, for the engineer, wishing to produce a great effect, intended to devote not less than seven quarts of nitroglycerin to the operation. But Pencroft, relieved by Neb, did so well that towards four o'clock in the evening the mine was finished. Now the question of setting fire to the explosive substance was raised. Generally, nitroglycerin is ignited by caps of fulminate, which in bursting cause the explosion. A shock is therefore needed to produce the explosion, for, simply lighted, this substance would burn without exploding. Cyrus Harding could certainly have fabricated a percussion cap. In default of fulminate, he could easily obtain a substance similar to gun cotton, since he had azotic acid at his disposal. This substance, pressed in a cartridge, and introduced among the nitroglycerin, would burst by means of a fuse and cause the explosion. But Cyrus Harding knew that nitroglycerin would explode by a shock. He resolved to employ this means and try another way, if this did not succeed. In fact, the blow of a hammer on a few drops of nitroglycerin, spread out on a hard surface, was enough to create an explosion. But the operator could not be there to give the blow without becoming a victim to the operation. Harding, therefore, thought of suspending a mass of iron, weighing several pounds, by means of a fiber, to an upright just above the mine. Another long fiber, previously impregnated with sulphur, was attached to the middle of the first by one end, while the other lay on the ground several feet distant from the mine. The second fiber being set on fire, it would burn till it reached the first. This catching fire in its turn would break, and the mass of iron would fall on the nitroglycerin. This apparatus being then arranged, the engineer, after having sent his companions to a distance, filled the hole so that the nitroglycerin was on a level with the opening. Then he threw a few drops of it on the surface of the rock, above which the mass of iron was already suspended. This done, Harding lit the end of the sulfured fiber, and leaving the place he returned with his companions to the chimneys. The fiber was intended to burn five and twenty minutes, and in fact five and twenty minutes afterwards a most tremendous explosion was heard. The island appeared to tremble to its very foundations. Stones were projected in the air as if by the eruption of a volcano. The shock produced by the displacing of the air was such that the rocks of the chimneys shook. The settlers, although they were more than two miles from the mine, were thrown on the ground. They rose, climbed the plateau, and ran towards the place where the bank of the lake must have been shattered by the explosion. A cheer escaped them. A large rent was seen in the granite. A rapid stream of water rushed foaming across the plateau and dashed down a height of three hundred feet on to the beach. End of chapter. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part 1 Chapter 18 Cyrus Harding's project had succeeded but, according to his usual habit, he showed no satisfaction. With closed lips and a fixed look, he remained motionless. Herbert was in ecstasies. Neb bounded with joy. Pencroft nodded his great head, murmuring these words, "'Come, our engineer gets on capitally!' The nitroglycerin had indeed acted powerfully. The opening which it had made was so large that the volume of water which escaped through this new outlet was at least treble that which before passed through the old one. The result was that a short time after the operation the level of the lake would be lowered two feet or more. The settlers went to the chimneys to take some pickaxes, iron-tipped spears, string made of fibers, flint, and steel. They then returned to the plateau, top accompanying them. On the way, the sailor could not help saying to the engineer, 
"'Don't you think, Captain, that by means of that charming liquid you have made, one could blow up the whole of our island?' "'Without any doubt, the island, continents, and the world itself,' replied the engineer. "'It is only a question of quantity.' "'Then could you not use this nitroglycerin for loading firearms?' asked the sailor. "'No, Pencroft, for it is too explosive a substance. But it would be easy to make some gun-cotton, or even ordinary powder, as we have azotic acid, saltpeter, sulphur, and coal. Unhappily, it is the guns which we have not got.' "'Oh, Captain,' replied the sailor, with a little determination. Pencroft had erased the word impossible from the dictionary of Lincoln Island. The settlers, having arrived on Prospect Heights, went immediately towards that point of the lake near which was the old opening now uncovered. This outlet had now become practicable, since the water no longer rushed through it, and it would doubtless be easy to explore the interior. In a few minutes the settlers had reached the lower point of the lake, and a glance showed them that the object had been attained. In fact, in the side of the lake, and now above the surface of the water, appeared the long-looked-for opening. A narrow ridge, left bare by the retreat of the water, allowed them to approach it. This orifice was nearly twenty feet in width, but scarcely two in height. It was like the mouth of a drain at the edge of a pavement, and therefore did not offer an easy passage to the settlers. But Neb and Pencroft, taking their pickaxes, soon made it of a suitable height. The engineer then approached, and found that the sides of the opening, in its upper part at least, had not a slope of more than from thirty to thirty-five degrees. It was therefore practicable, and, provided that the declivity did not increase, it would be easy to descend even to the level of the sea. If then, as was probable, some vast cavity existed in the interior of the granite, it might perhaps be of great use. "'Well, Captain, what are we stopping for?' asked the sailor, impatient to enter the narrow passage. "'You see, Top has got before us.' "'Very well,' replied the engineer. "'But we must see our way. Neb, go and cut some resinous branches.' Neb and Herbert ran to the edge of the lake, shaded with pines and other green trees, and soon returned with some branches, which they made into torches. The torches were lighted with flint and steel, and Cyrus Harding leading, the settlers ventured into the dark passage which the overplus of the lake had formerly filled. Contrary to what might have been supposed, the diameter of the passage increased as the explorers proceeded, so that they very soon were able to stand upright. The granite, worn by the water for an infinite time, was very slippery, and falls were to be dreaded. But the settlers were all attached to each other by a cord, as is frequently done in ascending mountains. Happily, some projections of the granite, forming regular steps, made the descent less perilous. Drops, still hanging from the rocks, shone here and there under the light of the torches, and the explorers guessed that the sides were clothed with innumerable stalactites. The engineer examined this black granite. There was not a stratum, not a break in it. The mass was compact, and of an extremely close grain. The passage dated, then, from the very origin of the island. It was not the water which little by little had hollowed it. Pluto, and not Neptune, had bored it with his own hand, and on the wall traces of an eruptive work could be distinguished, which all the washing of the water had not been able totally to efface. The settlers descended very slowly. They could not but feel a certain awe in thus venturing into these unknown depths, for the first time visited by human beings. They did not speak, but they thought, and the thought came to more than one, that some polypus or other gigantic cephalopod might inhabit the interior cavities which were in communication with the sea. However, Top kept at the head of the little band, and they could rely on the sagacity of the dog who would not fail to give the alarm if there was any need for it. After having descended about a hundred feet, following a winding road, Harding, who was walking on before, stopped, and his companions came up with him. The place where they had halted was wider, so as to form a cavern of moderate dimensions. 
drops of water fell from the vault, but that did not prove that they oozed through the rock. They were simply the last traces left by the torrent, which had so long thundered through this cavity, and the air there was pure, though slightly damp, but producing no mephitic exhalation. "'Well, my dear Cyrus,' said Gideon Spilett, "'here is a very secure retreat, well hid in the depths of the rock, but it is, however, uninhabitable.' "'Why uninhabitable?' asked the sailor. "'Because it is too small and too dark.' "'Couldn't we enlarge it, hollow it out, make openings to let in light and air?' replied Pencroft, who now thought nothing impossible. "'Let us go on with our exploration,' said Cyrus Harding. "'Perhaps lower down nature will have spared us this labour.' "'We have only gone a third of the way,' observed Herbert. "'Nearly a third, replied Harding, "'for we have descended a hundred feet from the opening.' and it is not impossible that a hundred feet farther down where is top asked neb interrupting his master they searched the cavern but the dog was not there most likely he has gone on said pencroft let us join him replied harding the descent was continued the engineer carefully observed all the deviations of the passage and notwithstanding so many detours he could easily have given an account of its general direction which went towards the sea. The settlers had gone some fifty feet farther when their attention was attracted by distant sounds which came up from the depths. They stopped and listened. These sounds, carried through the passage as through an acoustic tube, came clearly to the ear. "'That is top barking!' cried Herbert. "'Yes,' replied Pencroft and our brave dog is barking furiously. "'We have our iron-tipped spears,' said Cyrus Harding. "'Keep on your guard, and forward.' "'It is becoming more and more interesting,' murmured Gideon Spilett in the sailor's ear, who nodded. Harding and his companions rushed to the help of their dog. Top's barking became more and more perceptible, and it seemed strangely fierce. Was he engaged in a struggle with some animal whose retreat he had disturbed? Without thinking of the danger to which they might be exposed, the explorers were now impelled by an irresistible curiosity, and in a few minutes, sixteen feet lower, they rejoined Top. There the passage ended in a vast and magnificent cavern. Top was running backwards and forwards, barking furiously. Pencroft and Neb, waving their torches, through the light into every crevice, and at the same time, Harding, Gideon Spilett, and Herbert, their spears raised, were ready for any emergency which might arise. The enormous cavern was empty. The settlers explored it in every direction. There was nothing there, not an animal, not a human being, and yet Top continued to bark. Neither caresses nor threats could make him be silent. "'There must be a place somewhere by which the waters of the lake reach the sea,' said the engineer. "'Of course,' replied Pencroft, "'and we must take care not to tumble into a hole.' "'Go, Top, go!' cried Harding. The dog, excited by his master's words, ran towards the extremity of the cavern, and there redoubled his barking. They followed him, and by the light of the torches perceived the mouth of a regular well in the granite. It was by this that the water escaped, and this time it was not an oblique and practicable passage, but a perpendicular well, into which it was impossible to venture. The torches were held over the opening. Nothing could be seen. Harding took a lighted branch and threw it into the abyss. The blazing resin, whose illuminating power increased still more by the rapidity of its fall, lighted up the interior of the well, but yet nothing appeared. The flame then went out with a slight hiss, which showed that it had reached the water, that is to say, the level of the sea. The engineer, calculating the time employed in its fall, was able to calculate the depth of the well, which was found to be about ninety feet. The floor of the cavern must thus be situated ninety feet above the level of the sea. "'Here is our dwelling,' said Cyrus Harding. "'But it was occupied by some creature.' replied Gideon Spilett, whose curiosity was not yet satisfied. 
"'Well, the creature, amphibious or otherwise, has made off through this opening,' replied the engineer, "'and has left the place for us.' "'Never mind,' added the sailor. "'I should like very much to be topped just for a quarter of an hour, for he doesn't bark for nothing.' Cyrus Harding looked at his dog, and those of his companions who were near him might have heard him murmur these words. "'Yes, I believe that Top knows more than we do about a great many things.' However, the wishes of the settlers were, for the most part, satisfied. Chance, aided by the marvellous sagacity of their leader, had done them great service. They had now at their disposal a vast cavern, the size of which could not be properly calculated by the feeble light of their torches. But it would certainly be easy to divide it into rooms, by means of brick partitions, or to use it, if not as a house, at least as a spacious apartment. The water which had left it could not return. The place was free. Two difficulties remained. Firstly, the possibility of lighting this excavation in the midst of solid rock. Secondly, the necessity of rendering the means of access more easy. It was useless to think of lighting it from above, because of the enormous thickness of the granite which composed the ceiling, but perhaps the outer wall next to the sea might be pierced. Cyrus Harding, during the descent, had roughly calculated its obliqueness, and consequently the length of the passage, and was therefore led to believe that the outer wall could not be very thick. If light was thus obtained, so would a means of access, for it would be as easy to pierce a door as windows, and to establish an exterior ladder. Harding made known his ideas to his companions. "'Then, Captain, let us set to work,' replied Pencroft. "'I have my pickaxe, and I shall soon make my way through this wall. Where shall I strike?' "'Here,' replied the engineer, showing the sturdy sailor a considerable recess in the side, which would much diminish the thickness. Pencroft attacked the granite, and for half an hour, by the light of the torches, he made the splinters fly around him. Neb relieved him, then Spilett took Neb's place. This work had lasted two hours, and they began to fear that at this spot the wall would not yield to the pickaxe, when at a last blow given by Gideon Spilett the instrument, passing through the rock, fell outside. "'Hurrah! Hurrah!' cried Pencroft. The wall only measured there three feet in thickness. Harding applied his eye to the aperture, which overlooked the ground from a height of eighty feet. Before him was extended the sea-coast, the islet, and beyond the open sea. Floods of light entered by this hole, inundating the splendid cavern and producing a magic effect. On its left side it did not measure more than thirty feet in height and breadth but on the right it was enormous, and its vaulted roof rose to a height of more than eighty feet. In some places granite pillars, irregularly disposed, supported the vaulted roof, as those in the nave of a cathedral, here forming lateral piers, there elliptical arches, adorned with pointed mouldings, losing themselves in dark bays, amid the fantastic arches of which glimpses could be caught in the shade provided with a profusion of projections formed like so many pendants. This cavern was a picturesque mixture of all the styles of Byzantine, Roman, or Gothic architecture ever produced by the hand of man, and yet this was only the work of nature. She alone had hollowed this fairy Alhambra in a mass of granite. The settlers were overwhelmed with admiration. Where they had only expected to find a narrow cavity, they had found a sort of marvellous palace, and Neb had taken off his hat, as if he had been transported into a temple. Cries of admiration issued from every mouth, hurrahs resounded, and the echo was repeated again and again, till it died away in the dark naves. "'Ah, my friends!' exclaimed Cyrus Harding. "'When we have lighted the interior of this place, and have arranged our rooms and storehouses in the left part, we shall still have this splendid cavern which we will make our study and our museum. "'And we will call it?' asked Herbert. "'Granite House,' replied Harding, a name which his companions again saluted with a cheer. 
The torches were now almost consumed, and as they were obliged to return by the passage to reach the summit of the plateau, it was decided to put off the work necessary for the arrangement of their new dwelling till the next day. Before departing, Cyrus Harding leaned once more over the dark well, which descended perpendicularly to the level of the sea. He listened attentively. No noise was heard, not even that of the water, which the undulations of the surge must sometimes agitate in its depths. A flaming branch was again thrown in. The sides of the well were lighted up for an instant, but, as at the first time, nothing suspicious was seen. If some marine monster had been surprised unawares by the retreat of the water, he would by this time have regained the sea by the subterranean passage, before the new opening had been offered to him. Meanwhile, the engineer was standing motionless, his eyes fixed on the gulf, without uttering a word. The sailor approached him and touched his arm. Captain said he. "'What do you want, my friend?' asked the engineer, as if he had returned from the land of dreams. "'The torches will soon go out.' "'Forward,' replied Cyrus Harding. The little band left the cavern, and began to ascend through the dark passage. Top closed the rear, still growling every now and then. The ascent was painful enough. The settlers rested a few minutes in the upper grotto, which made a sort of landing-place halfway up the long granite staircase. Then they began to climb again. Soon fresher air was felt. The drops of water, dried by evaporation, no longer sparkled on the walls. The flaring torches began to grow dim. The one which Neb carried went out, and if they did not wish to find their way in the dark, they must hasten. This was done, and a little before four o'clock, at the moment when the sailor's torch went out in its turn, Cyrus Harding and his companions passed out of the passage. End of chapter The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part One, Chapter Nineteen. The next day, the twenty-second of May, the arrangement of their new dwelling was commenced. In fact, the settlers longed to exchange the insufficient shelter of the chimneys for this large and healthy retreat, in the midst of solid rock, and sheltered from the water both of the sea and sky. Their former dwelling was not, however, to be entirely abandoned, for the engineer intended to make a manufactory of it for important works. Cyrus Harding's first care was to find out the position of the front of Granite House from the outside. He went to the beach, and as the pickaxe, when it escaped from the hands of the reporter, must have fallen perpendicularly to the foot of the cliff, the finding it would be sufficient to show the place where the hole had been pierced in the granite. The pickaxe was easily found, and the hole could be seen in a perpendicular line above the spot where it was stuck in the sand. Some rock pigeons were already flying in and out of the narrow opening. They evidently thought that Granite House had been discovered on purpose for them. It was the engineer's intention to divide the right portion of the cavern into several rooms, preceded by an entrance passage, and to light it by means of five windows and a door pierced in the front. Pencroft was much pleased with the five windows, but he could not understand the use of the door, since the passage offered a natural staircase through which it would always be easy to enter Granite House. "'My friend,' replied Harding, "'if it is easy for us to reach our dwelling by this passage, it will be equally easy for others besides us. I mean, on the contrary, to block up that opening, to seal it hermetically, and, if it is necessary, to completely hide the entrance by making a dam, and thus causing the water of the lake to rise.' "'And how shall we get in?' asked the sailor by an outside ladder," replied Cyrus Harding, a rope ladder which, once drawn up, will render access to our dwelling impossible. "'But why so many precautions?' asked Pencroft. "'As yet we have seen no dangerous animals. As to our island being inhabited by natives, I don't believe it.' "'Are you quite sure of that, Pencroft?' 
asked the engineer, looking at the sailor. "'Of course we shall not be quite sure till we have explored it in every direction,' replied Pencroft. "'Yes,' said Harding, "'for we know only a small portion of it as yet. But at any rate, if we have no enemies in the interior, they may come from the exterior, for parts of the Pacific are very dangerous. We must be provided against every contingency.' Cyrus Harding spoke wisely, and, without making any further objection, Pencroft prepared to execute his orders. The front of Granite House was then to be lighted by five windows and a door, besides a large bay window and some smaller oval ones, which would admit plenty of light to enter into the marvellous nave which was to be their chief room. This façade, situated at a height of eighty feet above the ground, was exposed to the east, and the rising sun saluted it with its first rays. It was found to be just at that part of the cliff which was between the projection at the mouth of the Mercy and a perpendicular line traced above the heap of rocks which formed the chimneys. Thus the winds from the northeast would only strike it obliquely, for it was protected by the projection. Besides, until the window frames were made, the engineer meant to close the openings with thick shutters which would prevent either wind or rain from entering, and which could be concealed in need. The first work was to make the openings. This would have taken too long with the pickaxe alone, and it is known that Harding was an ingenious man. He had still a quantity of nitroglycerin at his disposal, and he employed it usefully. By means of this explosive substance the rock was broken open at the very places chosen by the engineer. Then, with the pickaxe and spade, the windows and doors were properly shaped, the jagged edges were smoothed off, and a few days after the beginning of the work, Granite House was abundantly lighted by the rising sun, whose rays penetrated into its most secret recesses. Following the plan proposed by Cyrus Harding, the space was to be divided into five compartments looking out on the sea. To the right, an entry with a door, which would meet the latter then a kitchen, thirty feet long, a dining-room, measuring forty feet, a sleeping-room of equal size, and lastly a visitor's room, petitioned for by Pencroft, and which was next to the great hall. These rooms, or rather this suite of rooms, would not occupy all the depth of the cave. There would be also a corridor and a storehouse, in which their tools, provisions, and stores would be kept. All the productions of the island, the flora as well as the fauna, were to be there in the best possible state of preservation, and completely sheltered from the damp. There was no want of space, so that each object could be methodically arranged. Besides, the colonists had still at their disposal the little grotto above the great cavern, which was like the garret of the new dwelling. This plan settled, it had only to be put into execution. The miners became brickmakers again, then the bricks were brought to the foot of Granite House. Till then Harding and his companions had only entered the cavern by the long passage. This mode of communication obliged them first to climb Prospect Heights, making a detour by the river's bank, and then to descend two hundred feet through the passage, having to climb as far when they wished to return to the plateau. This was a great loss of time, and was also very fatiguing. Cyrus Harding, therefore, resolved to proceed without any further delay to the fabrication of a strong rope ladder, which, once raised, would render Granite House completely inaccessible. This ladder was manufactured with extreme care, and its uprights, formed of the twisted fibers of a species of cane, had the strength of a thick cable. As to the rounds, they were made of a sort of red cedar, with light strong branches, and this apparatus was wrought by the masterly hand of Pencroft. Other ropes were made with vegetable fibers, and a sort of crane with a tackle was fixed at the door. In this way bricks could easily be raised into Granite House. The transport of the materials being thus simplified, the arrangement of the interior could begin immediately. There was no want of lime, and some thousands of bricks were there ready to be used. The framework of the partitions was soon raised, very roughly at first, 
and in a short time the cave was divided into rooms and storehouses according to the plan agreed upon. These different works progressed rapidly under the direction of the engineer, who himself handled the hammer and the trowel. No labor came amiss to Cyrus Harding, who thus set an example to his intelligent and zealous companions. They worked with confidence, even gaily, Pencroft always having some joke to crack, sometimes carpenter, sometimes rope-maker, sometimes mason, while he communicated his good humor to all the members of their little world. His faith in the engineer was complete. Nothing could disturb it. He believed him capable of undertaking anything and succeeding in everything. The question of boots and clothes, assuredly a serious question, that of light during the winter months, utilizing the fertile parts of the island, transforming the wild flora into cultivated flora. It all appeared easy to him. Cyrus Harding helping, everything would be done in time. He dreamed of canals facilitating the transport of the riches of the ground, workings of quarries and mines, machines for every industrial manufacture, railroads, yes, railroads, of which a network would certainly one day cover Lincoln Island. The engineer let Pencroft talk. He did not put down the aspirations of this brave heart. He knew how communicable confidence is. He even smiled to hear him speak, and said nothing of the uneasiness for the future which he felt. In fact, in that part of the Pacific, out of the course of vessels, it was to be feared that no help would ever come to them. It was on themselves, on themselves alone, that the settlers must depend for the distance of Lincoln Island from all other land was such that to hazard themselves in a boat of a necessarily inferior construction would be a serious and perilous thing. But, as the sailor said, they quite took the wind out of the sails of the Robinsons, for whom everything was done by a miracle. In fact, they were energetic. An energetic man will succeed where an indolent one would vegetate and inevitably perish. Herbert distinguished himself in these works. He was intelligent and active. Understanding quickly, he performed well, and Cyrus Harding became more and more attached to the boy. Herbert had a lively and reverent love for the engineer. Pencroft saw the close sympathy which existed between the two, but he was not in the least jealous. Neb was Neb. He was what he would be always, courage, zeal, devotion, self-denial personified. He had the same faith in his master that Pencroft had, but he showed it less vehemently. When the sailor was enthusiastic, Neb always looked as if he would say, Nothing could be more natural. Pencroft and he were great friends. As to Gideon Spilett, he took part in the common work, and was not less skillful in it than his companions, which always rather astonished the sailor. A journalist, clever, not only in understanding, but in performing everything. The latter was finally fixed on the 28th of May. There was not less than a hundred rounds in this perpendicular height of eighty feet. Harding had been able, fortunately, to divide it in two parts profiting by an overhanging of the cliff which made a projection forty feet above the ground. This projection, carefully leveled by the pickaxe, made a sort of platform, to which they fixed the first ladder, of which the oscillation was thus diminished one half, and a rope permitted it to be raised to the level of Granite House. As to the second ladder, it was secured both at its lower part, which rested on the projection, and at its upper end, which was fastened to the door. In short, the ascent had been made much easier. Besides, Cyrus Harding hoped later to establish an hydraulic apparatus, which would avoid all fatigue and loss of time for the inhabitants of Granite House. The settlers soon became habituated to the use of this ladder. They were light and active, and Pencroft, as a sailor, accustomed to run up the masts and shrouds, was able to give them lessons. But it was also necessary to give them to top. The poor dog, with his four paws, was not formed for this sort of exercise. But Pencroft was such a zealous master that top ended by properly performing his ascents, 
and soon mounted the ladder as readily as his brethren in the circus. It need not be said that the sailor was proud of his pupil. However, more than once Pencroft hoisted him on his back, which Top never complained of. It must be mentioned here that during these works, which were actively conducted, for the bad season was approaching, the elementary question was not neglected. Every day the reporter and Herbert, who had been voted purveyors to the colony, devoted some hours to the chase. As yet they only hunted in Jacamar Wood, on the left of the river, because, for want of a bridge or boat, the Mercy had not yet been crossed. All the immense woods, to which the name of the forests of the far west had been given, were not explored. They reserved this important excursion for the first fine days of the next spring. But Jacamar Wood was full of game, kangaroos and boars abounded, and the hunters' iron-tipped spears and bows and arrows did wonders. Besides, Herbert discovered toward the southwest point of the lagoon a natural warren, a slightly damp meadow covered with willows and aromatic herbs which scented the air, such as thyme, basil, savory, all the sweet-scented species of the labiated plants, which the rabbits appeared to be particularly fond of. On the reporter observing that since the table was spread for the rabbits, it was strange that the rabbits themselves should be wanting, the two sportsmen carefully explored the warren. At any rate, it produced an abundance of useful plants, and a naturalist would have had a good opportunity of studying many specimens of the vegetable kingdom. Herbert gathered several shoots of the basil, rosemary, balm, betony, etc., which possessed different medicinal properties, some pectoral, astringent, febrifuge, others antispasmodic or anti-rheumatic. When, afterwards, Pencroft asked the use of this collection of herbs, "'For medicine,' replied the lad, "'to treat us when we are ill.' "'Why should we be ill, since there are no doctors in the island?' asked Pencroft, quite seriously. There was no reply to be made to that, but the lad went on with his collection all the same, and it was well received at Granite House. Besides these medicinal herbs, he added a plant known in North America as Oswego tea, which made an excellent beverage. At last, by searching thoroughly, the hunters arrived at the real site of the warren. There the ground was perforated like a sieve. "'Here are the burrows!' cried Herbert. "'Yes,' replied the reporter. "'So I see.' "'But are they inhabited?' "'That is the question.' This was soon answered. Almost immediately hundreds of little animals, similar to rabbits, fled in every direction, with such rapidity that even Top could not overtake them. Hunters and dog ran in vain. These rodents escaped them easily." but the reporter resolved not to leave the place until he had captured at least half a dozen of the quadrupeds. He wished to stock their larder first, and domesticate those which they might take later. It would not have been difficult to do this, with a few snares stretched at the openings of the burrows. But at this moment they had neither snares nor anything to make them of. They must therefore be satisfied with visiting each hole and rummaging in it with a stick, hoping by dint of patience to do what could not be done in any other way. At last, after half an hour, four rodents were taken in their holes. They were similar to their European brethren, and are commonly known by the name of American rabbits. This produce of the chase was brought back to Granite House, and figured at the evening repast. The tenants of the warren were not at all to be despised, for they were delicious. It was a valuable resource of the colony, and it appeared to be inexhaustible. On the 31st of May the partitions were finished. The rooms had now only to be furnished, and this would be work for the long winter days. A chimney was established in the first room, which served as the kitchen. The pipe destined to conduct the smoke outside gave some trouble to these amateur bricklayers. It appeared simplest to Harding to make it of brick clay, as creating an outlet for it to the upper plateau was not to be thought of. A hole was pierced in the granite above the window of the kitchen, and the pipe met it like that of an iron stove. 
Perhaps the winds which blew directly against the façade would make the chimney smoke, but these winds were rare, and besides, Master Neb, the cook, was not so very particular about that. When these interior arrangements were finished, the engineer occupied himself in blocking up the outlet by the lake, so as to prevent any access by that way. Masses of rock were rolled to the entrance and strongly cemented together. Cyrus Harding did not yet realize his plan of drowning this opening under the waters of the lake by restoring them to their former level by means of a dam. He contented himself with hiding the obstruction with grass and shrubs, which were planted in the interstices of the rocks, and which next spring would sprout thickly. However, he used the waterfall so as to lead a small stream of fresh water to the new dwelling. A little trench, made below their level, produced this result, and this derivation from a pure and inexhaustible source yielded twenty-five or thirty gallons a day. There would never be any want of water at Granite House. At last all was finished, and it was time, for the bad season was near. Thick shutters closed the windows of the façade, until the engineer had time to make glass. Gideon Spilett had very artistically arranged on the rocky projections, around the windows, plants of different kinds, as well as long streaming grass, so that the openings were picturesquely framed in green, which had a pleasing effect. The inhabitants of this solid, healthy, and secure dwelling could not but be charmed with their work. The view from the windows extended over a boundless horizon, which was closed by the two mandible capes on the north and Claw Cape on the south. All Union Bay was spread before them. Yes, our brave settlers had reason to be satisfied, and Pencroft was lavish in his praise of what he humorously called his apartments on the fifth floor above the ground. End of chapter The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part 1, Chapter 20 The winter season set in with the month of June, which corresponds with the month of December in the northern hemisphere. It began with showers and squalls, which succeeded each other without intermission. The tenants of Granite House could appreciate the advantages of a dwelling which sheltered them from the inclement weather. The chimneys would have been quite insufficient to protect them against the rigor of winter, and it was to be feared that the high tides would make another eruption. Cyrus Harding had taken precautions against this contingency, so as to preserve as much as possible the forge and furnace which were established there. During the whole of the month of June, the time was employed in different occupations, which excluded neither hunting nor fishing the larder being therefore abundantly supplied. Pencroff, so soon as he had leisure, proposed to set some traps, from which he expected great results. He soon made some snares with creepers, by the aid of which the warren henceforth every day furnished its quota of rodents. Neb employed nearly all his time in salting or smoking meat, which ensured their always having plenty of provisions. The question of clothes was now seriously discussed, the settlers having no other garments than those they wore when the balloon threw them on the island. These clothes were warm and good, they had taken great care of them as well as of their linen, and they were perfectly whole, but they would soon need to be replaced. Moreover, if the winter was severe, the settlers would suffer greatly from cold. On this subject the ingenuity of Harding was at fault. They must provide for their most pressing wants, settle their dwelling, and lay in a store of food. Thus the cold might come upon them before the question of clothes had been settled. They must therefore make up their minds to pass this first winter without additional clothing. When the fine season came round again, they would regularly hunt those musmons which had been seen on the expedition to Mount Franklin, and the wool once collected. The engineer would know how to make it into strong, warm stuff. How? He would consider. "'Well, we are free to roast ourselves at Granite House,' said Pencroft. "'There are heaps of fuel, and no reason for sparing it.' 
Besides, added Gideon Spilett, Lincoln Island is not situated under a very high latitude, and probably the winters here are not severe. Did you not say, Cyrus, that this thirty-fifth parallel corresponded to that of Spain in the other hemisphere? Doubtless, replied the engineer, but some winters in Spain are very cold, no want of snow and ice, and perhaps Lincoln Island is just as rigorously tried. However, it is an island, and as such I hope that the temperature will be more moderate. Why, Captain? asked Herbert. Because the sea, my boy, may be considered as an immense reservoir, in which is stored the heat of the summer. When winter comes, it restores this heat, which ensures for the regions near the ocean a medium temperature, less high in summer, but less low in winter. We shall prove that, replied Pencroft. But I don't want to bother myself about whether it will be cold or not. One thing is certain, that is, that the days are already short, and the evenings long. Suppose we talk about the question of light. Nothing is easier, replied Harding. To talk about, asked the sailor, to settle. And when shall we begin? Tomorrow, by having a seal hunt. To make candles? Yes. Such was the engineer's project, and it was quite feasible, since he had lime and sulfuric acid, while the amphibians of the islet would furnish the fat necessary for the manufacture. They were now at the 4th of June. It was Whit Sunday, and they agreed to observe this feast. All work was suspended, and prayers were offered to heaven. But these prayers were now thanksgivings. The settlers in Lincoln Island were no longer the miserable castaways thrown on the islet. They asked for nothing more. They gave thanks. The next day, the 5th of June, in rather uncertain weather, they set out for the islet. They had to profit by the low tide to cross the channel, and it was agreed that they would construct for this purpose, as well as they could, a boat which should render communication so much easier, and would also permit them to ascend the Mercy, at the time of their grand exploration of the southwest of the island, which was put off till the first fine days. The seals were numerous, and the hunters, armed with their iron-tipped spears, easily killed half a dozen. Neb and Pencroft skinned them, and only brought back to Granite House their fat and skin, this skin being intended for the manufacture of boots. The result of the hunt was this, nearly three hundred pounds of fat, all to be employed in the fabrication of candles. The operation was extremely simple, and if it did not yield absolutely perfect results, they were at least very useful. Cyrus Harding would only have at his disposal sulfuric acid, but by heating this acid with the neutral fatty bodies, he could separate the glycerin. Then, from this new combination, he easily separated the olein, the margarine, and the stearin by employing boiling water. But to simplify the operation, he preferred to saponify the fat by means of lime. By this, he obtained a calcareous soap easy to decompose by sulfuric acid, which precipitated the lime into the state of sulfate and liberated the fatty acids. From these three acids, oleic, margaric, and stearic, the first, being liquid, was driven out by a sufficient pressure. As to the two others, they formed the very substance of which the candles were to be molded. This operation did not last more than four and twenty hours. The wicks, after several trials, were made of vegetable fibers, and dipped in the liquefied substance, they formed regular stearic candles, molded by the hand, which only wanted whiteness and polish. They would not doubtless have the advantage of the wicks which are impregnated with boracic acid, and which vitrify as they burn and are entirely consumed, but Cyrus Harding, having manufactured a beautiful pair of snuffers, these candles would be greatly appreciated during the long evenings in Granite House. During this month there was no want of work in the interior of their new dwelling. The joiners had plenty to do. They improved their tools, which were very rough, and added others also. Scissors were made among other things, and the settlers were at last able to cut their hair, and also to shave, 
or at least trim their beards. Herbert had none, Neb but little, but their companions were bristling in a way which justified the making of the said scissors. The manufacture of a handsaw cost infinite trouble, but at last an instrument was obtained which, when vigorously handled, could divide the ligneous fibres of the wood. They then made tables, seats, cupboards, to furnish the principal rooms, and bedsteads, of which all the bedding consisted of grass mattresses, the kitchen with its shelves on which rested the cooking utensils, its brick stove, looked very well, and Neb worked away there as earnestly as if he was in a chemist's laboratory. But the joiners had soon to be replaced by carpenters. In fact, the waterfall created by the explosion rendered the construction of two bridges necessary, one on Prospect Heights, the other on the shore. Now the plateau and the shore were transversely divided by a watercourse, which had to be crossed to reach the northern part of the island. To avoid it, the colonists had been obliged to make a considerable detour by climbing up to the source of the Red Creek. The simplest thing was to establish on the plateau and on the shore two bridges from twenty to five and twenty feet in length. All the carpenter's work that was needed was to clear some trees of their branches. This was a business of some days. Directly the bridges were established, Neb and Pencroft profited by them to go to the oyster bed which had been discovered near the downs. They dragged with them a sort of rough cart, which replaced the former inconvenient hurdle, and brought back some thousands of oysters, which soon increased among the rocks and formed a bed at the mouth of the Mercy. These mollusks were of excellent quality, and the colonists consumed some daily. It has been seen that Lincoln Island, although its inhabitants had as yet only explored a small portion of it, already contributed to almost all their wants. It was probable that if they hunted into its most secret recesses, in all the wooded part between the Mercy and Reptile Point, they would find new treasures. The settlers in Lincoln Island had still one privation. There was no want of meat, nor of vegetable products. Those ligneous roots which they had found, when subjected to fermentation, gave them an acid drink, which was preferable to cold water. They also made sugar, without canes or beet roots, by collecting the liquor which distills from the Acer saccharinum, a sort of maple tree, which flourishes in all the temperate zones, and of which the island possessed a great number. They made a very agreeable tea by employing the herbs brought from the warren. Lastly, they had an abundance of salt, the only mineral which is used in food, but bread was wanting. Perhaps in time the settlers could replace this want by some equivalent. It was possible that they might find the sago, or the breadfruit tree, among the forest of the south, but they had not as yet met with these precious trees. However, Providence came directly to their aid, in an infinitesimal proportion, it is true, but Cyrus Harding, with all his intelligence, all his ingenuity, would never have been able to produce that which, by the greatest chance, Herbert one day found in the lining of his waistcoat, which he was occupied in setting to rights. On this day, as it was raining in torrents, the settlers were assembled in the great hall in Granite House, when the lad cried out all at once, "'Look here, Captain! A grain of corn!' And he showed his companions a grain, a single grain, which from a hole in his pocket had got into the lining of his waistcoat. The presence of this grain was explained by the fact that Herbert, when at Richmond, used to feed some pigeons, of which Pencroft had made him a present. "'A grain of corn?' said the engineer quickly. "'Yes, Captain, but one, only one.' "'Well, my boy,' said Pencroft, laughing, "'we're getting on capitally, upon my word. What shall we make with one grain of corn?' "'We will make bread of it,' replied Cyrus Harding. "'Bread, cakes, tarts,' replied the sailor. "'Come, the bread that this grain of corn will make won't choke us very soon.' Herbert, not attaching much importance to his discovery, was going to throw away the grain in question, but Harding took it, examined it, 
found that it was in good condition, and looking the sailor full in the face, Pencroft, he asked quietly, do you know how many ears one grain of corn can produce? One, I suppose, replied the sailor, surprised at the question. Ten, Pencroft, and do you know how many grains one ear bears? No, upon my word. About eighty, said Cyrus Harding. Then if we plant this grain, at the first crop we shall reap eight hundred grains, which at the second will produce six hundred and forty thousand, at the third five hundred and twelve millions, at the fourth more than four hundred thousands of millions. There is the proportion. Harding's companions listened without answering. These numbers astonished them. They were exact, however. Yes, my friends, continued the engineer, such are the arithmetical progressions of prolific nature, and yet what is this multiplication of the grain of corn, of which the ear only bears eight hundred grains, compared to the poppy plant, which bears thirty-two thousand seeds, to the tobacco plant, which produces three hundred and sixty thousand? In a few years, without the numerous causes of destruction, which arrest their fecundity, these plants would overrun the earth. But the engineer had not finished his lecture. And now, Pencroft, he continued, do you know how many bushels four hundred thousand millions of grains would make? <laughs> no, replied the sailor, but what I do know is that I am nothing better than a fool. Well, they would make more than three millions at a hundred and thirty thousand a bushel, Pencroft. Three millions! cried Pencroft. Three millions. In four years? In four years, replied Cyrus Harding. And even in two years, if, as I hope, in this latitude we can obtain two crops a year. At that, according to his usual custom, Pencroft could not reply otherwise than by a tremendous hurrah. So, Herbert, added the engineer, you have made a discovery of great importance to us. Everything, my friends, everything can serve us in the condition in which we are. Do not forget that, I beg of you. No, Captain, no, we shan't forget it, replied Pencroft. And if ever I find one of those tobacco seeds, which multiply by three hundred and sixty thousand, I assure you I won't throw it away. And now, what must we do? We must plant this grain, replied Herbert. Yes, added Gideon Spilett, and with every possible care, for it bears in itself our future harvests. Provided it grows, cried the sailor. It will grow, replied Cyrus Harding. This was the 20th of June. The time was then propitious for sowing this single precious grain of corn. It was first proposed to plant it in a pot, but upon reflection it was decided to leave it to nature and confide it to the earth. This was done that very day, and it is needless to add that every precaution was taken that the experiment might succeed. The weather having cleared, the settlers climbed the height above Granite House. There on the plateau they chose a spot, well sheltered from the wind, and exposed to all the heat of the midday sun. The place was cleared, carefully weeded, and searched for insects and worms. Then a bed of good earth, improved with a little lime, was made. It was surrounded by a railing and the grain was buried in the damp earth. Did it not seem as if the settlers were laying the first stone of some edifice? It recalled to Pencroft the day on which he lighted his only match, and all the anxiety of the operation. But this time the thing was more serious. In fact, the castaways would have been always able to procure fire in some mode or other, but no human power could supply another grain of corn, if, unfortunately, this should be lost. End of chapter The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, Part 1, Chapter 21 
From this time Pencroft did not let a single day pass without going to visit what he gravely called his cornfield, and woe to the insects which dared to venture there, no mercy was shown them. Towards the end of the month of June, after incessant rain, the weather became decidedly colder, and on the twenty-ninth the Fahrenheit thermometer would certainly have announced only twenty degrees above zero, that is considerably below the freezing point. The next day, the thirtieth of June, the day which corresponds to the thirty-first of December in the northern year, was a Friday. Neb remarked that the year finished on a bad day, but Pencroft replied that naturally the next would begin on a good one, which was better. At any rate, it commenced by very severe cold. Ice accumulated at the mouth of the Mercy, and it was not long before the whole expanse of the lake was frozen. The settlers had frequently been obliged to renew their store of wood. Pencroft also had wisely not waited till the river was frozen, but had brought enormous rafts of wood to their destination. The current was an indefatigable moving power, and it was employed in conveying the floating wood to the moment when the frost enchained it. To the fuel which was so abundantly supplied by the forest, they added several cartloads of coal, which had to be brought from the foot of the spurs of Mount Franklin. The powerful heat of the coal was greatly appreciated in the low temperature, which on the 4th of July fell to 8 degrees of Fahrenheit, that is, 13 degrees below zero. A second fireplace had been established in the dining-room, where they all worked together at their different avocations. During this period of cold, Cyrus Harding had great cause to congratulate himself on having brought to Granite House the little stream of water from Lake Grant. Taken below the frozen surface and conducted through the passage, it preserved its fluidity and arrived at an interior reservoir which had been hollowed out at the back part of the storeroom, while the overflow ran through the well to the sea. About this time, the weather being extremely dry, the colonists, clothed as warmly as possible, resolved to devote a day to the exploration of that part of the island between the Mercy and Claw Cape. It was a wide extent of marshy land, and they would probably find good sport, for water birds ought to swarm there. They reckoned that it would be about eight or nine miles to go there, and as much to return, so that the whole of the day would be occupied. As an unknown part of the island was about to be explored, the whole colony took part in the expedition. Accordingly, on the 5th of July, at six o'clock in the morning, when day had scarcely broken, Cyrus Harding, Gideon Spilett, Herbert, Neb, and Pencroft, armed with spears, snares, bows, and arrows, and provided with provisions, left Granite House preceded by Top, who bounded before them. Their shortest way was to cross the Mercy on the ice, which then covered it. But, as the engineer justly observed, that could not take the place of a regular bridge. So the construction of a regular bridge was noted in the list of future works. It was the first time that the settlers had set foot on the right bank of the Mercy, and ventured into the midst of those gigantic and superb coniferae now sprinkled over with snow. But they had not gone half a mile when from a thicket a whole family of quadrupeds, who had made a home there, disturbed by top, rushed forth into the open country. "'Ah! I should say those are foxes!' cried Herbert, when he saw the troop rapidly decamping. They were foxes, but of a very large size who uttered a sort of barking, at which Top seemed to be very much astonished, for he stopped short in the chase, and gave the swift animals time to disappear. The dog had reason to be surprised, as he did not know natural history. But by their barking, these foxes, with reddish-gray hair, black tails terminating in a white tuft, had betrayed their origin. So Herbert was able, without hesitating, to give them their real name of Arctic foxes. They are frequently met with in Chile, in the Falkland Islands, and in all parts of America traversed by the thirtieth and fortieth parallels. Herbert much regretted that Top had not been able to catch one of these carnivora. "'Are they good to eat?' asked Pencroft, who only regarded the representatives of the fauna in the island from one special point of view." 
No, replied Herbert, but zoologists have not yet found out if the eye of these foxes is diurnal or nocturnal, or whether it is correct to class them in the genus dog, properly so called. Harding could not help smiling on hearing the lad's reflection, which showed a thoughtful mind. As to the sailor, from the moment when he found that the foxes were not classed in the genus eatable, they were nothing to him. However, when a poultry yard was established at Granite House, he observed that it would be best to take some precautions against a probable visit from these four-legged plunderers, and no one disputed this. After having turned the point, the settlers saw a long beach washed by the open sea. It was then eight o'clock in the morning. The sky was very clear, as it often is after prolonged cold, but warmed by their walk, neither Harding nor his companions felt the sharpness of the atmosphere too severely. Besides, there was no wind, which made it much more bearable. A brilliant sun, but without any calorific action, was just issuing from the ocean. The sea was as tranquil and blue as that of a Mediterranean gulf, when the sky is clear. Claw Cape, bent in the form of a yatagan, tapered away nearly four miles to the southeast. To the left, the edge of the marsh was abruptly ended by a little point. Certainly in this part of Union Bay, which nothing sheltered from the open sea, not even a sandbank, ships beaten by the east winds would have found no shelter. They perceived by the tranquillity of the sea, in which no shallows troubled the waters, by its uniform color, which was stained by no yellow shades, by the absence of even a reef, that the coast was steep, and that the ocean there covered a deep abyss. Behind in the west, at a distance of four miles, rose the first trees of the forest of the far west. They might have believed themselves to be on the desolate coast of some island in the Antarctic regions which the ice had invaded. The colonists halted at this place for breakfast. A fire of brushwood and dried seaweed was lighted, and Ned prepared the breakfast of cold meat, to which he added some cups of Oswego tea. While eating they looked around them. This part of Lincoln Island was very sterile, and contrasted with all the western part. The reporter was thus led to observe that if chance had thrown them at first on the shore, they would have had but a deplorable idea of their future domain. "'I believe that we should not have been able to reach it,' replied the engineer, "'for the sea is deep, and there is not a rock on which we could have taken refuge. Before Granite House, at least, there were sandbanks, an islet, which multiplied our chances of safety.' Here, nothing but the depths. It is singular enough, remarked Spilett, that this comparatively small island should present such varied ground. This diversity of aspect, logically, only belongs to continents of a certain extent. One would really say that the western part of Lincoln Island, so rich and so fertile, is washed by the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico and that its shores to the north and the southeast extend over a sort of arctic sea. "'You are right, my dear Spilett,' replied Cyrus Harding. "'I have also observed this. I think the form and also the nature of this island strange. It is a summary of all the aspects which a continent presents, and I should not be surprised if it was a continent formerly.' "'What? A continent in the middle of the Pacific?' cried Pencroft. "'Why not?' replied Cyrus Harding. "'Why should not Australia, New Ireland, Australasia, united to the archipelagos of the Pacific, have once formed a sixth part of the world, as important as Europe or Asia, as Africa or the two Americas? To my mind it is quite possible that all these islands, emerging from this vast ocean, are but the summits of a continent now submerged, but which was above the waters at a prehistoric period. "'As the Atlantis was formerly,' replied Herbert. "'Yes, my boy, if, however, it existed.' "'And would Lincoln Island have been a part of that continent?' asked Pencroft. "'It is probable,' replied Cyrus Harding, "'and that would sufficiently explain the variety of productions which are seen on its surface.' 
and the great number of animals which still inhabit it added herbert yes my boy replied the engineer and you furnish me with an argument to support my theory it is certain after what we have seen that animals are numerous in this island and what is more strange that the species are extremely varied there is a reason for that and to me it is that lincoln island may have formerly been a part of some vast continent which is gradually sunk below the pacific then some fine day said pencroft who did not appear to be entirely convinced the rest of this ancient continent may disappear in its turn and there will be nothing between america and asia yes replied harding there will be new continents which millions and millions of animaculae are building at this moment and what are these masons asked pencroft coral insects replied cyrus harding by constant work they made the island of clermont tonnerre and numerous other coral islands in the pacific ocean forty-seven millions of these insects are needed to weigh a grain and yet with the sea salt they absorb the solid elements of water which they assimilate these animaculae produce limestone and this limestone forms enormous submarine erections of which the hardness and solidity equal granite formerly at the first periods of creation nature employing fire heaved up the land but now she entrusts to these microscopic creatures the task of replacing this agent of which the dynamic power in the interior of the globe has evidently diminished which is proved by the number of volcanoes on the surface of the earth now actually extinct and i believe that centuries succeeding to centuries and insects to insects this pacific may one day be changed into a vast continent which new generations will inhabit and civilize in their turn that will take a long time said pencroft nature has time for it replied the engineer but what would be the use of new continents asked herbert it appears to me that the present extent of habitable countries is sufficient for humanity yet nature does nothing uselessly nothing uselessly certainly replied the engineer but this is how the necessity of new continents for the future and exactly on the tropical zone occupied by the coral islands may be explained at least to me this explanation appears plausible we are listening captain said herbert this is my idea philosophers generally admit that some day our globe will end or rather that animal and vegetable life will no longer be possible because of the intense cold to which it will be subjected what they are not agreed upon is the cause of this cold some think it will arise from the falling of the temperature which the sun will experience after millions of years others from the gradual extinction of the fires in the interior of our globe which have a greater influence on it than is generally supposed i hold to this last hypothesis grounding it on the fact that the moon is really a cold star which is no longer habitable although the sun continues to throw on its surface the same amount of heat if then the moon has become cold it is because the interior fires to which as do all the stars of the stellar world it owes its origin are completely extinct lastly whatever may be the cause our globe will become cold some day but this cold will only operate gradually what will happen then the temperate zones at a more or less distant period will not be more habitable than the polar regions now are then the population of men as well as the animals will flow towards the latitudes which are more directly under the solar influence an immense emigration will take place europe central asia north america will gradually be abandoned as well as australasia and the lower parts of south america the vegetation will follow the human emigration the flora will retreat towards the equator at the same time as the fauna 
The central parts of South America and Africa will be the continents chiefly inhabited. The Laplanders and the Samoides will find the climate of the polar regions on the shores of the Mediterranean. Who can say that at this period the equatorial regions will not be too small to contain and nourish terrestrial humanity? Now may not provident nature, so as to give refuge to all the vegetable and animal emigration, be at present laying the foundation of a new continent under the equator, and may she not have entrusted these insects with the construction of it? I have often thought of all these things, my friends, and I seriously believe that the aspect of our globe will some day be completely changed, that by the raising of new continents the sea will cover the old, and that, in future ages, a Columbus will go to discover the islands of Chimborazo, of the Himalayas, or of Mount Blanc, remains of a submerged America, Asia, and Europe. Then these new continents will become in their turn uninhabitable. Heat will die away, as does the heat from a body when the soul has left it, and life will disappear from the globe, if not forever, at least for a period. Perhaps then our spheroid will rest, will be left to death, to revive some day under superior conditions. But all that, my friends, is the secret of the author of all things, and beginning by the work of the insects, I have perhaps let myself be carried too far in investigating the secrets of the future. My dear Cyrus, replied Spilett, these theories are prophecies to me, and they will be accomplished some day. That is the secret of God, said the engineer. All that is well and good, then said Pencroft, who had listened with all his might. But will you tell me, Captain, if Lincoln Island has been made by your insects? No, replied Harding. It is of a purely volcanic origin. Then it will disappear some day? That is probable. I hope we won't be here then. No, don't be uneasy, Pencroft. We shall not be here then, as we have no wish to die here and hope to get away some time. In the meantime, replied Gideon Spilett, let us establish ourselves here as if forever. There is no use in doing things by halves. This ended the conversation. Breakfast was finished, the exploration was continued, and the settlers arrived at the border of the marshy region. It was a marsh of which the extent to the rounded coast which terminated the island at the southeast was about twenty square miles. The soil was formed of clayey flint earth, mingled with vegetable matter, such as the remains of rushes, reeds, grass, etc. Here and there beds of grass, thick as a carpet, covered it. In many places icy pools sparkled in the sun. Neither rain nor any river, increased by a sudden swelling, could supply these ponds. They therefore naturally concluded that the marsh was fed by the infiltrations of the soil, and it was really so. It was also to be feared that during the heat miasmas would arise, which might produce fevers. Above the aquatic plants, on the surface of the stagnant water, fluttered numbers of birds. Wild duck, teal, snipe lived there in flocks, and those fearless birds allowed themselves to be easily approached. One shot from a gun would certainly have brought down some dozen of the birds, they were so close together. The explorers were, however, obliged to content themselves with bows and arrows. The result was less, but the silent arrow had the advantage of not frightening the birds, while the noise of firearms would have dispersed them to all parts of the marsh. The hunters were satisfied for this time with a dozen ducks, which had white bodies with a band of cinnamon, a green head, wings black, white, and red, and flattened beak. Herbert called them Tadorns. Top helped in the capture of these birds, whose name was given to this marshy part of the island. The settlers had here an abundant reserve of aquatic game. At some future time they meant to explore it more carefully, and it was probable that some of the birds there might be domesticated, or at least brought to the shores of the lake, so that they would be more within their reach. 
About five o'clock in the evening Cyrus Harding and his companions retraced their steps to their dwelling by traversing Tadorn's fens and crossed the Mercy on the ice bridge. At eight in the evening they all entered Granite House. End of chapter The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part One, Chapter Twenty Two This intense cold lasted until the fifteenth of August, without, however, passing the degree of Fahrenheit already mentioned. When the atmosphere was calm, the low temperature was easily borne, but when the wind blew, the poor settlers, insufficiently clothed, felt it severely. Pencroft regretted that Lincoln Island was not the home of a few families of bears rather than of so many foxes and seals. "'Bears,' said he, "'are generally very well dressed, and I ask no more than to borrow for the winter the warm cloaks which they have on their backs.' <laughs> "'But,' replied Neb, laughing, "'perhaps the bears would not consent to give you their cloaks, Pencroft. These beasts are not St. Martin's.' "'We would make them do it, Neb. We would make them.' replied Pencroft, in quite an authoritative tone. But these formidable carnivora did not exist in the island, or at any rate they had not as yet shown themselves. In the meanwhile, Herbert, Pencroft, and the reporter occupied themselves with making traps on Prospect Heights and at the border of the forest. According to the sailor, any animal, whatever it was, would be a lawful prize, and the rodents or carnivora which might get into the new snares would be well received at Granite House. The traps were, besides, extremely simple, being pits dug in the ground, a platform of branches and grass above, which concealed the opening, and at the bottom some bait, the scent of which would attract animals. It must be mentioned also that they had not been dug at random, but at certain places where numerous footprints showed that quadrupeds frequented the ground. They were visited every day, and at three different times during the first days specimens of those antarctic foxes which they had already seen on the right bank of the mercy were found in them why there are nothing but foxes in this country cried pencroft when for the third time he drew one of the animals out of the pit looking at it in great disgust he added beasts which are good for nothing yes said gideon spilett they are good for something and what is that to make bait to attract other creatures the reporter was right, and the traps were henceforward baited with the fox's carcasses. The sailor had also made snares from the long tough fibers of a certain plant, and they were even more successful than the traps. Rarely a day passed without some rabbits from the warren being caught. It was always rabbit, but Neb knew how to vary his sauces, and the settlers did not think of complaining. However, once or twice in the second week of August, the traps supplied the hunters with other animals more useful than foxes, namely, several of those small wild boars which had already been seen to the north of the lake. Pencroft had no need to ask if these beasts were eatable. He could see that by their resemblance to the pig of America and Europe. "'But these are not pigs,' said Herbert to him. "'I warn you of that, Pencroft.' "'My boy!' replied the sailor, bending over the trap and drawing out one of those representatives of the family of Seuss by the little appendage which served it as a tail. Let me believe that these are pigs. Why? Because that pleases me. Are you very fond of pig, then, Pencroft? I am very fond of pig, replied the sailor, particularly of its feet, and if it had eight instead of four I should like it twice as much. As to the animals in question, they were peccaries belonging to one of the four species which are included in the family, and they were also of the species of Tajaku, recognizable by their deep color and the absence of those long teeth with which the mouths of their congeners are armed. These peccaries generally live in herds, and it was probable that they abounded in the woody parts of the island. At any rate, they were eatable from head to foot, and Pencroft did not ask more from them. Towards the 15th of August, the state of the atmosphere was suddenly moderated by the wind shifting to the northwest. The temperature rose seven degrees, and the accumulated vapor in the air was not long in resolving into snow. 
all the island was covered with a sheet of white, and showed itself to its inhabitants under a new aspect. The snow fell abundantly for several days, and it soon reached a thickness of two feet. The wind also blew with great violence, and at the height of Granite House the sea could be heard thundering against the reefs. In some places the wind, eddying around the corners, formed the snow into tall whirling columns, resembling those water-spouts which turn round on their base, and which vessels attack with a shot from a gun. However, the storm, coming from the northwest, blew across the island, and the position of Granite House preserved it from a direct attack. But in the midst of this snowstorm, as terrible as if it had been produced in some polar country, neither Cyrus Harding nor his companions could, notwithstanding their wish for it, venture forth, and they remained shut up for five days, from the 20th to the 25th of August. They could hear the tempest raging in the Jacamar Woods, which would surely suffer from it. Many of the trees would no doubt be torn up by the roots, but Pencroft consoled himself by thinking that he would not have the trouble of cutting them down. "'The wind is turning woodman. Let it alone,' he repeated. Besides, there was no way of stopping it, if they had wished to do so. How grateful the inhabitants of Granite House then were to heaven for having prepared for them this solid and immovable retreat! Cyrus Harding had also his legitimate share of thanks, but, after all, it was nature who had hollowed out this vast cavern, and he had only discovered it. They all were in safety, and the tempest could not reach them. If they had constructed a house of bricks and wood on Prospect Heights, it certainly would not have resisted the fury of this storm. As to the chimneys, it must have been absolutely uninhabitable, for the sea, passing over the islet, would beat furiously against it. But here, in Granite House, in the middle of a solid mass, over which neither the sea nor air had any influence, there was nothing to fear. During these days of seclusion the sailors did not remain inactive. There was no want of wood, cut up into planks, in the storeroom, and little by little they completed their furnishing, constructing the most solid of tables and chairs, for material was not spared. Neb and Pencroft were very proud of this rather heavy furniture, which they would not have changed on any account. Then the carpenters became basket-makers, and they did not succeed badly in this new manufacture. At the point of the lake which projected to the north, they had discovered an osier bed in which grew a large number of purple osiers. Before the rainy season, Pencroft and Herbert had cut down these useful shrubs, and their branches, well prepared, could now be effectively employed. The first attempts were somewhat crude but in consequence of the cleverness and intelligence of the workmen, by consulting and recalling the models which they had seen, and by emulating each other, the possessions of the colony were soon increased by several baskets of different sizes. The storeroom was provided with them, and in special baskets Neb placed his collections of rhizomes, stone-pine almonds, etc., during the last week of the month of August, the weather moderated again. The temperature fell a little, and the tempest abated. The colonists sallied out directly. There was certainly two feet of snow on the shore, but they were able to walk without much difficulty on the hardened surface. Cyrus Harding and his companions climbed to Prospect Heights. What a change! The woods, which they had left green, especially in the part at which the firs predominated, had disappeared under a uniform color. All was white, from the summit of Mount Franklin to the shore, the forest, the plains, the lake, the river. The waters of the Mercy flowed under a roof of ice, which at each rising and ebbing of the tide broke up with loud crashes. Numerous birds fluttered over the frozen surface of the lake. Ducks and snipe, teal and guillemot, were assembled in thousands. The rocks among which the cascade flowed were bristling with icicles. One might have said that the water escaped by a monstrous gargoyle, shaped with all the imagination of an artist of the Renaissance. As to the damage caused by the storm in the forest, that could not as yet be ascertained. 
they would have to wait till the snowy covering was dissipated. Gideon Spilett, Pencroft, and Herbert did not miss this opportunity of going to visit their traps. They did not find them easily under the snow with which they were covered. They had also to be careful not to fall into one or other of them, which would have been both dangerous and humiliating, to be taken in their own snares. But happily they avoided this unpleasantness, and found their traps perfectly intact. No animal had fallen into them, and yet the footprints in the neighborhood were very numerous, among others certain very clear marks of claws. Herbert did not hesitate to affirm that some animal of the feline species had passed there, which justified the engineer's opinion that dangerous beasts existed in Lincoln Island. These animals doubtless generally lived in the forests of the far west, but, pressed by hunger, they had ventured as far as Prospect Heights. Perhaps they had smelled out the inhabitants of Granite House. "'Now what are these feline creatures?' asked Pencroft. "'They are tigers,' replied Herbert. "'I thought those beasts were only found in hot countries.' "'On the new continent,' replied the lad, "'they are found from Mexico to the pampas of Buenos Aires. Now, as Lincoln Island is nearly under the same latitude as the provinces of La Plata, it is not surprising that tigers are to be met with in it.' "'Well, we must look out for them,' replied Pencroft. However, the snow soon disappeared, quickly dissolving under the influence of the rising temperature. Rain fell, and the sheet of white soon vanished. Notwithstanding the bad weather, the settlers renewed their stores of different things, stone pine almonds, rhizomes, syrup from the maple tree, for the vegetable part, rabbits from the warren, agoutis, and kangaroos, for the animal part. This necessitated several excursions into the forest, and they found that a great number of trees had been blown down by the last hurricane. Pencroft and Neb also pushed with a cart as far as the vein of coal, and brought back several tons of fuel. They saw in passing that the pottery kiln had been severely damaged by the wind, at least six feet of it having been blown off. At the same time as the coal, the store of wood was renewed at Granite House, and they profited by the current of the Mercy having again become free to float down several rafts. They could see that the cold period was not ended. A visit was also paid to the chimneys, and the settlers could not but congratulate themselves on not having been living there during the hurricane. The sea had left unquestionable traces of its ravages. Sweeping over the islet, it had furiously assailed the passages, half filling them with sand, while thick beds of seaweed covered the rocks. While Neb, Herbert, and Pencroft hunted or collected wood, Cyrus Harding and Gideon Spilett busied themselves in putting the chimneys to rights, and they found the forge and the bellows almost unhurt, protected as they had been from the first by the heaps of sand. The store of fuel had not been made uselessly. The settlers had not done with the rigorous cold. It is known that, in the northern hemisphere, the month of February is principally distinguished by rapid fallings of the temperature. It is the same in the southern hemisphere, and the end of the month of August, which is the February of North America, does not escape this climatic law. About the 25th, after another change from snow to rain, the wind shifted to the southeast, and the cold became suddenly very severe. According to the engineer's calculation, the mercurial column of a Fahrenheit thermometer would not have marked less than eight degrees below zero, and this intense cold, rendered still more painful by a sharp gale, lasted for several days. The colonists were again shut up in Granite House and as it was necessary to hermetically seal all the openings of the façade, only leaving a narrow passage for renewing the air, the consumption of candles was considerable. To economize them, the cavern was often only lighted by the blazing hearths, on which fuel was not spared. Several times, one or other of the settlers descended to the beach in the midst of ice, which the waves heaped up at each tide, but they soon climbed up again to Granite House, and it was not without pain and difficulty that their hands could hold to the rounds of the ladder. 
in consequence of the intense cold, their fingers felt as if burned when they touched the rounds. To occupy the leisure hours, which the tenants of Granite House now had at their disposal, Cyrus Harding undertook an operation which could be performed indoors. We know that the settlers had no other sugar at their disposal than the liquid substance which they drew from the maple, by making deep incisions in the tree. They contented themselves with collecting this liquor in jars, and employing it in this state for different culinary purposes, and the more so, as on growing old, this liquid began to become white and to be of a syrupy consistence. But there was something better to be made of it, and one day Cyrus Harding announced that they were going to turn into refiners. "'Refiners!' replied Pencroft. "'That is rather a warm trade, I think.' "'Very warm,' answered the engineer. "'Then it will be seasonable,' said the sailor. This word refining need not awaken the mind thoughts of an elaborate manufactory with apparatus and numerous workmen. No. To crystallize this liquor, only an extremely easy operation is required. Placed on the fire in large earthen pots, it was simply subjected to evaporation, and soon a scum arose to its surface. As soon as this began to thicken, Neb carefully removed it with a wooden spatula. This accelerated the evaporation, and at the same time prevented it from contracting an empyreumatic flavor. After boiling for several hours on a hot fire, which did as much good to the operators as the substance operated upon, the latter was transformed into a thick syrup. This syrup was poured into clay moulds, previously fabricated in the kitchen stove, and to which they had given various shapes. The next day this syrup had become cold, and formed cakes and tablets. This was sugar of rather a reddish color, but nearly transparent, and of a delicious taste. The cold continued to the middle of September, and the prisoners in Granite House began to find their captivity rather tedious. Nearly every day they attempted sorties which they could not prolong. They constantly worked at the improvement of their dwelling. They talked while working. Harding instructed his companions in many things, principally explaining to them the practical applications of science. The colonists had no library at their disposal, but the engineer was a book which was always at hand, always open at the page which one wanted, a book which answered all their questions, and which they often consulted. The time thus passed away pleasantly, these brave men not appearing to have any fears for the future. However, all were anxious to see, if not the fine season, at least the cessation of the insupportable cold. If only they had been clothed in a way to meet it, how many excursions they would have attempted, either to the Downs or to Tadorn's Fens. Game would have been easily approached, and the chase would certainly have been most productive. But Cyrus Harding considered it of importance that no one should injure his health, for he had need of all his hands, and his advice was followed. But it must be said that the one who was most impatient of this imprisonment, after Pencroft, perhaps, was Top. The faithful dog found Granite House very narrow. He ran backwards and forwards from one room to another, showing in his way how weary he was of being shut up. Harding often remarked that when he approached the dark well which communicated with the sea, and of which the orifice opened at the back of the storeroom, Top uttered singular growlings. He ran round and round this hole, which had been covered with a wooden lid. Sometimes he even tried to put his paws under the lid, as if he wished to raise it. He then yelped in a peculiar way, which showed at once anger and uneasiness. The engineer observed this manoeuvre several times. What could there be in this abyss to make such an impression on the intelligent animal? The well led to the sea, that was certain. Could narrow passages spread from it through the foundations of the island? Did some marine monster come from time to time to breathe at the bottom of this well? The engineer did not know what to think and could not refrain from dreaming of many strange improbabilities. 
accustomed to go far into the regions of scientific reality, he would not allow himself to be drawn into the regions of the strange and almost of the supernatural. But yet how to explain why Top, one of those sensible dogs who never waste their time in barking at the moon, should persist in trying with scent and hearing to fathom this abyss, if there was nothing there to cause his uneasiness. Top's conduct puzzled Cyrus Harding even more than he cared to acknowledge to himself. At all events, the engineer only communicated his impressions to Gideon Spilett, for he thought it useless to explain to his companions the suspicions which arose from what perhaps was only Top's fancy. At last the cold ceased. There had been rain, squalls mingled with snow, hailstorms, gusts of wind, but these inclemencies did not last. The ice melted, the snow disappeared, the shore, the plateau, the banks of the Mercy, the forest, again became practicable. This return of spring delighted the tenants of Granite House, and they soon only passed in it the hours necessary for eating and sleeping. They hunted much in the second part of September, which led Pencroft to again entreat for the firearms, which he asserted had been promised by Cyrus Harding. The latter, knowing well that without special tools it would be nearly impossible for him to manufacture a gun which would be of any use, still drew back and put off the operation to some future time, observing in his usual dry way that Herbert and Spilett had become very skilful archers, so that many sorts of excellent animals, agoutis, kangaroos, capybaras, pigeons, bustards, wild ducks, snipes, in short, game both with fur and feathers, fell victims to their arrows, and that, consequently, they could wait. But the obstinate sailor would listen to nothing of this, and he would give the engineer no peace till he promised to satisfy his desire. Gideon Spilett, however, supported Pencroft. "'If, which may be doubted,' said he, "'the island is inhabited by wild beasts, we must think how to fight with and exterminate them. A time may come when this will be our first duty." But at this period it was not the question of firearms which occupied Harding, but that of clothes. Those which the settlers wore had passed this winter, but they would not last till next winter. Skins of carnivora or the wool of ruminants must be procured at any price, and since there were plenty of musmons, it was agreed to consult on the means of forming a flock which might be brought up for the use of the colony. An enclosure for the domestic animals, a poultry yard for the birds, in a word, to establish a sort of farm in the island, such were the two important projects for the fine season. In consequence and in view of these future establishments, it became of much importance that they should penetrate into all the yet unknown parts of Lincoln Island, that is to say, through that thick forest which extended on the right bank of the Mercy, from its mouth to the extremity of the Serpentine Peninsula, as well as on the whole of its western side. But this needed settled weather and a month must pass before this exploration could be profitably undertaken. They therefore waited with some impatience, when an incident occurred which increased the desire the settlers had to visit the whole of their domain. It was the 24th of October. On this day Pencroft had gone to visit his traps, which he always kept properly baited. In one of them he found three animals which would be very welcome for the larder. They were a female peccary and her two young ones. Pencroft then returned to Granite House, enchanted with his capture, and as usual he made a great show of his game. "'Come, we shall have a grand feast, Captain!' he exclaimed. "'And you too, Mr. Spilett, you will eat some.' "'I shall be very happy,' replied the reporter. "'But what is it that I am going to eat?' "'Suckling pig!' Oh, indeed, suckling pig, Pencroft. To hear you, I thought that you were bringing back a young partridge stuffed with truffles. What? cried Pencroft. Do you mean to say that you turn up your nose at suckling pig? No, replied Gideon Spilett, without showing any enthusiasm, provided one doesn't eat too much. 
"'That's right, that's right,' returned Sailor, who was not pleased whenever he heard his chase made light of. "'You like to make objections. Seven months ago, when we landed on the island, you would have been only too glad to have met with such game.' "'Well, well,' replied the reporter, "'man is never perfect nor contented.' now said pencroft i hope that neb will distinguish himself look here these two little peccaries are not more than three months old they will be as tender as quails come along neb come i will look after the cooking myself and the sailor followed by neb entered the kitchen where they were soon absorbed in their culinary labors they were allowed to do it in their own way neb therefore prepared a magnificent repast the two little peccaries, kangaroo soup, a smoked ham, stone pine almonds, Oswego tea, in fact all the best that they had, but among all the dishes figured in the first rank the savoury peccaries. At five o'clock dinner was served in the dining-room of Granite House. The kangaroo soup was smoking on the table. They found it excellent. To the soup succeeded the peccaries, which Pencroft insisted on carving himself and of which he served out monstrous portions to each of the guests. These suckling pigs were really delicious, and Pencroft was devouring his share with great gusto, when all at once a cry and an oath escaped him. "'What's the matter?' asked Cyrus Harding. "'The matter? I, the matter is that I've just broken a tooth,' replied the sailor. "'What? Are there pebbles in your peccaries?' said Gideon Spilett. "'I suppose so,' replied Pencroft, drawing from his lips the object which had cost him a grinder. It was not a pebble. It was a leaden bullet. End of chapter.